all together now. There is practically no area of business where the difference between rhetoric and actuality is greater than in the handling of people. Every businessman will always claim that it is the people in his organization who are the key to its success. This is constantly attested to by the statements in company annual reports. I cannot remember the last time I failed to see the chairman's last sentence paying tribute to his people. Yet despite all these facts, our skills at enabling our people to give of their best and continuously beat the best that come against them are remarkably tenuous. Moreover, this area of activity is seldom subject to the sort of analysis, debate and experimentation so readily devoted to fields such as production or marketing. When did you last see an improvement plan for the management of your people? If you have seen one, I would bet long money that the plan referred to reduction of administrative costs or overheads rather than being a consciously adopted plan to enable more of our people to contribute more. The problem is made even more difficult because we have no way of measuring how much better the whole outfit could do, let alone how much more each individual could contribute. Long ago, work study officers introduced the concept of rating to address the rate at which people performed physical tasks, such as loading machines, against a theoretical average. No such system exists to address, even in subjective terms, the rate of actual performance of our people against their potential. The system doesn't exist for the very good reason that neither we nor they have any idea what that potential is or could be. Each time we tell ourselves we've reached the limit, we find we can go the extra mile. The fact that we don't have the tools to measure this gap doesn't excuse us, however, from making the effort. It is extraordinary that we are prepared to put more effort into improving our accountancy than into motivating our people. It is even odder that we would not expect a manager to manage any technical activity without exhaustive training, testing and coaching, whilst we assume that any technically qualified individual can be put in charge of people and produce results. During this decade, many of the sources of competitive advantage on which companies have traditionally been able to rely are being eroded. There was a time when a technological lead gave one a substantial, sustainable advantage, but today technology is transferred almost as soon as it is discovered. For many years, individuals believed that it was possible to obtain a lead by the use of information technology. But here again, the newest and the best is almost instantly available across the world. The speed of modern communications and the force of international competition require the quickest possible adoption of new ideas if companies are to survive at all. Business is becoming more and more akin to intellectual sumo wrestling. Business success is based ever more directly and speedily on the abilities of the people in the business to change, foresee trends, take acceptable risks, be more in tune with the needs of today's customers tomorrow, and to set their stores out for the myriad of economic and social changes which are occurring. To seize advantage in these ways is not a matter of brute force, but rather one of finely honed intelligence, coupled with genuine qualities of character, and a continuous dedication to staying ahead in the race. Just as athletics demonstrate continuously that it is the frame of mind of the athlete rather than sheer physical power which is a decisive factor in winning, so it is with business. But the difficulty is that while few will contest these statements, equally few follow the logic of their beliefs through to a coherent and consistent philosophy which imbues their company from top to bottom. Recent years have seen the emergence of an almost unbelievable dogma about the ways in which competitive business behaviour can be engendered in individuals. The most prominent of these is, I suppose, the belief that the unbridled and unfettered use of market forces will, on their own, ensure that people will give her their best so that long-term effectiveness will ensue. 
The fear of unemployment, balanced with performance-related rewards, are thought to be enough of themselves to enlist the wholehearted commitment to give of their best. In this approach, the belief seems to be that men and women are motivated solely by economic considerations, and selfish ones at that, although I doubt that any reader of this book would recognise such behaviour in themselves. Indeed, fear of being fired is more likely to provoke a reaction of keeping one's head down and avoiding risk than a determination to succeed at a difficult task. All modern business is a matter of working with other people, both within one's own company and those outside as suppliers and customers. Working with others calls for continual adjustment to their views and is a far more subtle pressure than sheer economics on the individual. The job of businessmen and women is to win, to create, lead, inspire and motivate teams of people who, by their creativity, speed of reaction, dedication and relevance to the needs of tomorrow, will ensure that their business gets in front and stays there. There is increasingly a view that managing people is a science. Indeed, at least one prominent academic attributes the failures of British management to our inability to view management scientifically. We do not react predictably like a substance in a chemical experiment. The same group of people will react to the same events differently on Monday from on Friday. On Monday, the week lies ahead of them and they're looking ahead to what they want to accomplish. On Friday, many of them will already be thinking of the weekend delights with their family. In my view, management is not so much a science as an art. It is an art because management consists of enlisting the freely given support of disparate groups of people at different times to achieve, by their own free will, an agreed common purpose. There has also been an increasing belief that in some way the logarithmic expansion of information technology and computing power will supersede the human brain and reduce the human input into business. It is certainly true that the increasing force of computer capability has rendered many of the routine tasks which have been done by human beings unnecessary. But we blind ourselves if we think that business is just going to be a sort of computer chess game between our computer programs and those of our rival company. Business is not a circumscribed operation. There are no clearly defined rules, moves or actions, and nor does it take place upon a prescribed stage. The whole essence of business is the almost total freedom which exists for any company or business to change itself in any way that the people who are involved in it wish to. Far from replacing the human element in business, the growth of information technology places an even higher premium upon human skills. Some of the world's most successful products have been launched despite dire predictions of failure by the experts and scientific study of the potential demand for a product. It is well known that the Sony Walkman, one of the world's greatest successes which created an entire new range of consumer products, was introduced by Marita, the boss of Sony, not only in defiance of market research, but also the views of his own managers. At the same time, currently, two completely contradictory views of the importance and role of people appear to be holding sway. The first is that only an elite minority of super brains will be able to cope with the business demands of the future. The difficulty with this argument is that business is not just a question of logic and intelligence. Business is a battle of minds and wills. It calls for most extensive use of every human quality, be it courage, optimism, balance, judgment, humour, moral conviction, ethical values, sensitivity and so on. The distribution of these rarer human qualities does not necessarily equate with Mensa ratings of human intelligence. Neither Richard Branson nor Alan Sugar would claim to have achieved academic greatness, but few would argue with their impressive achievements as businessmen. Moreover, 
most business decisions have already moved far beyond the capability of single minds and single individuals to deal with them. Business decision making is increasingly a collective operation in which it is the ability to play as a team player, to listen, to build on others' ideas and to make two and two equal five rather than three and a half, which is actually the key to success. There is little doubt in my mind that tomorrow's business scene requires the potential abilities of every man and woman, more particularly since in Britain we seem to find it so difficult to develop the actual capability of our people, except under conditions of war. If you believe, as I do, that this is the true potential area for the revival of British business, you tend to be looked upon as either a crank or a hopeless optimist. Nevertheless, as I have travelled around, I have been impressed by the success of those who have actually tried to set their businesses and organisations on new paths by releasing the energy, capability, creativity and enthusiasm of their people. The negative aspects of management, particularly with regard to people, are continuously harped upon. But the concept of a totally different and broader approach to the involvement of people in businesses of every size still seems to be as far away as it ever was. The whole concept of management in Britain has been debased and is looked upon as being synonymous with control and regulation. Control and regulation might be needed if the problem the country faced was one where every person was so madly enthusiastic and besotted by the desire for business success that the problem was to hold them back and control carefully the pace of change and advance. It would be difficult to draw a more illusory picture of the business scene in the United Kingdom than that. We simply have to find, as I pointed out in my first management book, Making It Happen, ways of switching people on rather than ways of turning people off. Working as a team means flexibility of treatment and people always give of their best when they believe that they are valued as individuals. Nobody wants to be exactly the same as everybody else. We all of us start from different basic ideas and it is weaving these together into a dynamic whole which makes for the successful team. Almost everything in modern business is done by groups of people and each member of the group will probably display different behaviour and ideas about what is important to them. The reward system is seldom constructed to stimulate the behaviour that the group wishes to encourage and most companies are clearer about what they don't want than what they do. Risk-taking is usually punished, as are deviations from the normal behaviour of the group. All of this gives very different messages to people who are attempting to work together and contribute to the common goal. It is my belief that in the United Kingdom we have greater opportunities for change and beneficial improvement, both for individuals and for our country, than in most other countries. I make no apology for my conviction that most of our people are of very high calibre. Despite the pleasure we almost all seem to derive from continually harping on our inadequacies or the characteristics which we dislike, we still manage to maintain a number of key characteristics which are widely appreciated and envied. We are basically a tolerant society which respects the individual and we have high creative capabilities as evidenced by our relative success in invention and the achievement of Nobel Prizes. Most of us have latent scientific and technical capabilities which although undeveloped are still there, plain for all to see. Although there are specific pockets of other countries, for example California, where young people have even greater computer awareness than in the United Kingdom, as a generalization our young people are comfortable with computers and, thanks to one of our rare educational successes, they are open to the use of information technology. We have many of the essential building blocks for success, and yet we utilise the abilities of our people almost uniquely badly. For a variety of reasons, our educational system has tended to be elitist, and to borrow a phrase which I greatly admire, we educate for failure. Our failure to raise self-esteem and self-belief in our people 
is enhanced by the thankfully dying legacies of our class system. Even though I have lived through a total revolution in social mobility, the United Kingdom is characterised by people who believe that, by reason of birth, education, opportunity or background, many of life's prizes are beyond their reach. Anyone who has worked with American, German and British workforces knows that every American and most Germans believe that they are capable of doing any job within the organisation, including that of chairman. It is only in Britain that we apply self-selected limits to our own capabilities, and this, together with our lack of belief in training and our general attitudes to work and business, have held us back in the World Olympics of business success. However, the very fact that we have not tackled these problems opens tremendous opportunities for us if we can only get to grips with the underlying difficulties. If we are to change our approach to these things, there seem to me to be three key actions which we have to take. The first is that we have to open up the whole debate and argument on the subject of how to enable our people to perform closer to their real abilities. This should be a subject for discussion, analysis and experimentation and will involve changes in attitude and approach in most areas of our social fabric and activity. The second field of action is that I believe we must shift the whole basis of leadership, motivation and administration increasingly towards the encouragement of the individual and away from the bureaucratic treatment of groups. Treating people as groups tends to be almost entirely for the benefit of the administration. We can only hope to succeed as businesses and as a country when each individual is operating as close to the absolute limits of his or her ability as is possible. The last area where we simply have to change as companies is in our roles as those responsible for people. It is up to us to create some sort of order and consistency of the framework within which our people work. At present, because we so seldom look at these things in an holistic way, we have created disparities and inconsistencies between the administrative systems, the management, the company's values and its business aims. These disparities make it difficult for our people to give of their best. The task of managing and leading people is much more akin to being the conductor of an orchestra. A carefully selected, trained and conducted orchestra brings a totally new meaning and interpretation to a well-loved piece of music. Moreover, each player gains from the others, and they all find themselves playing beyond their personal achievements in individual practice. A concert is much more than the sum of its parts. The interaction with the audience, the effect of the concert hall, and the whole ambience are all parts of the conductor's repertoire, which enable him or her to achieve a unique and soaring performance. The successful manager of a successful enterprise will have put every bit as much attention to the creation and training of his own orchestra. He will be very conscious of the need to relate to his audience the customer, and he will be careful to tune into the concert hall, the environment in which the business is being conducted. He makes sure he gets plenty of advice on the technicalities of playing the various instruments, be it production, design, research or accountancy. The final results depend upon the people whom he selects, trains, rehearses and coaches. But ultimately they all have to play their own parts. Just as a concert can be wrecked by one player, so can a business. The aim has to be to get everyone working together, each individual playing superbly, but all in perfect harmony with each other. It is the manager who pulls them all together so that they make more than the sum of the individual parts. No one is ever in any doubt when a business is in overdrive. Suddenly you have the initiative and the whole business begins to hum. Problems cease to be problems and are viewed as opportunities. Less time and effort is necessary to achieve commitment to the actions that are being taken and the whole business really begins to take off. 
The extraordinary thing about this process is that ultimately the business begins truly to run itself. As your people's confidence in their ability to deliver increases, they will continuously seek more demanding girls. Nothing will be beyond their reach. Ultimately, the chief executive of a business in overdrive begins to feel that his staff are the ones pushing him, rather than him being the continuous spur pushing everybody else. This process, which is so rewarding for everybody concerned, is the absolute key to releasing energy and increasing capability. The starting point to achieve this sort of managerial nirvana really lies in ensuring that the value systems of the business are congruent with the values and aspirations of the individuals. These values are the glue that holds the whole thing together. The values of businesses are usually embedded in their history and derive very frequently from those who set up the company in the first place. Thereafter, they tend to develop a sort of self-reinforcing quality. Employees are selected who appear to empathise with the values of the group and indeed individuals seek companies whose values they admire. Iconoclasts are unwelcome and are frozen out by their peers in the very early days. Peer groups tend to ostracise those that do not fit in and in business, where success depends on working with others, people who do not join in find it difficult to get things done. The difficulty is that values need to change and evolve. IBM's values derived directly from Thomas Watson's views and concepts, which were so detailed and so rigorously applied that even expected styles of dress continued for years after the business change. It is curious that in business people are so careless about selecting the values for their organisation and so willing to hazard them for a relatively minor cost advantage. The concerns of a company the size of ICI for its people its wish to be in the forefront of management ideas, and the relationship and involvement of its people derived directly from the personal values of its founding fathers, Brunner and Mond. They had long been dead by the time I joined the company, and yet the ideas on which they had based their business continued to influence the company every bit as strongly as in their own day. Similarly, the very special features of speed and informality that characterise Virgin derived directly from Richard Branson's own characteristics and beliefs and mean that the company is willing to tackle anyone and anything regardless of size. Although business values derive in most cases from the beliefs and business philosophy of a leader or leaders at some specific period of time, it is essential that the values of the company reflect both the business needs and competitive characteristics of that business. Obviously, Different types of businesses need specific kinds of value systems in order to retain competitive success. It does not take a genius to see that chemical companies which are not concerned about the environment are unlikely to survive for a long period of time. If you want a business to reflect these kinds of concerns, you will better make sure that you recruit people who value the world of nature and have a proper respect for the universe which is our host. By definition, these broad concepts are reflected very clearly in the interests, concerns and ways in which people go about their daily lives. It is far better to build into one's values concern about the environment than to attempt to enforce environmental compliance by imposing rules on people whose hearts are not involved in the objective at all. A value statement for a company is in essence a personality profile of the company and hence of the people in it. It is an open declaration of the attitudes and personal characteristics which are admired and considered essential for business success. But it is much more than that. Clearly the expressed values in a company tend to attract people who are comfortable with that sort of existence. Ultimately, long after the existing leaders have left, the value system of a company will provide a checklist for the personality profile of future leaders and also continue to attract people who possess the characteristics which the company believes to be essential for its success. However, there is a trap in all of this. The moment may come when the old values need to be changed. It is very difficult indeed to change well-entrenched beliefs in an organisation. 
It takes a long time to bed them in, and an equally long time to ensure that they are changed beyond the possibility of bouncing back. There is a curious continuity of corporate memory which is itself resistant to change. I believe that five years of sustained, concentrated and skillful effort is a minimum that will be necessary to change a long-established value system. The difficulty is that although company values will and probably should have a very long life, it is all too easy for them to become fixed, rather like flies in amber. When that happens, a company can rapidly lose the ability to change quickly enough to keep up with the rest of the world. Both IBM and General Motors had extremely strong corporate cultures, which had stood them in good stead in the past. Neither culture, however, outstandingly successful, though they had been in slower moving and slower changing times, was able to adapt sufficiently fast to the hurricane of change which is upon us now. Writing a statement of values is likely to lead one into the same sort of trap which the mission statements which have been produced by practically all companies over the past years have faced. I am a strong believer in a mission statement, as indeed I am a believer in a statement of values. But the difficulty is that both statements can easily become the sort of soft consensus of terms which are acceptable to everybody. Most of us could write an all-purpose mission or value statement in any bar on a Tuesday night which could apply to any company in the world. But statements of values are, after all, codes of belief and behaviour and involve making very hard choices and making them unambiguously. They are bound to be contentious if they are to be worth anything. It doesn't take a great deal of thought to understand that it is necessary to know whether you are trying to run a marathon or a relay sprint race, and that the approaches to training, preparation and physical and mental characteristics are totally different for the two types of sport. It doesn't require long hours of meetings at every level in the company to recognise that change and flexibility are not the same as consistency, reliability and predictability, that high achievement and risk-taking are incompatible with the avoidance of failure, and so on. When making a statement of values, you need to check continuously that you are indeed prepared to reject the opposite of what you are selecting for the basis of your future business. Of course the problem is that everyone always wants everything, and that it is rather like writing a job description. For any job in any business, you can easily end up with a fine pen portrait of Superman. Values, if they are to motivate, are about choices because there are only a limited number of values which you can hope adequately to demonstrate consistently day in, day out. The essence of a value statement is that all your people will continuously test themselves, you, your colleagues, the systems and the actions of the company against the values which have been professed. It is not a bit of use including a statement that you wish to run an open company unless the board and the chairman are personally going to welcome the barrage of criticism which should properly be unleashed. And not only welcome, but pay attention to the points and actually endeavour to meet the concerns which are expressed. The ultimate aim is to produce a single sentence statement which will encompass the key characteristics which will describe the sort of company that you are and wish to become in the future. It is the points of difference from other companies or the areas where particular attention needs to be addressed that must be stressed. At all costs avoid weasel words, which purport to say one thing, but really are designed to obfuscate the harshness of the point. However, it is perfectly permissible to use shorthand terms in a value statement. For example, the word professionalism signifies very high standards the necessity for continual improvement, learning and the pursuit of excellence in every aspect of the business in which you are involved. A value statement which is going to be in use will highlight areas of confrontation, will bring problems out in the open and attack them in order to turn them into opportunities. It will be about grabbing the initiative and actively going for solutions rather than hoping that time will alleviate or remove the problems that you have identified. I have long admired the American company 3M. They seem to me to be one of the small number of highly successful companies 
who have managed almost to institutionalize creativity and the development of new products and ideas. How did any of us exist before post-its? If you talk to them about this continued success, they attribute it, I believe rightly, to the principles which they apply to managing their people. There are four, and they don't differ very much from the principles many other companies claim to espouse. They are to respect the dignity and work of individuals, to encourage the initiative of each employee, to challenge individual capabilities, and to provide equal opportunity for development. The difference from other companies is that the 3M management believe totally in these principles and follow them in detail day in and day out. They are not new and they have endured through many changes of management. But the way in which they have been applied and the detailed follow-up systems supporting them have continually evolved and altered. The well-known story of the development of the ubiquitous post-it note is a splendid example of the practical appliance of all of these beliefs. The initial invention was a failure, an adhesive which did not fix permanently but retains its stickiness. The inventor, a 3M employee, used it privately to put reminders on personal documents and was encouraged by the company to develop the idea further. It's now a worldwide successful business in its own right. Most value statements emanate from the chief executive, and indeed should. But it is of the greatest possible importance that if the chief executive produces a statement which you do not believe he can live up to, that he should be challenged quickly. I believe, therefore, that the first approach to a value statement by a chief executive should often start as a private checklist of the style that he wants, both for himself and for his outfit, and he must be a continuous example of them. This is not easy, and is an additional reason why I believe that value statements should be short and encompass no more than four or five points. The difficulty of living by them is that the chief executive is on duty 24 hours a day and 365 days a year. But if you cannot undertake the changes which you consider necessary for the group as a whole, you should make the break and move on. Only when you have been living the values yourself and have observed them throughout the company is it safe to write them down. Only then can such a written code be helpful instead of posing a major risk of losing credibility, trust and belief. The reality is that every group of people must have a shared set of values. If this is not so, they do not actually exist as a group. The skill required is not only to recognize this fact, but to build on and enhance the ones which will be helpful to future success, and to work hard to eliminate the unsuccessful ones. This calls for you to think your way through the whole of your business needs and to make a real and continuous effort to manage the changes which are going to be required. The difference from other business situations is that these soft issues involve emotions and deeply held beliefs. Working on corporate values calls for sensitivity and persistence, but such work is essential if your company is to adjust to the changing world and to prosper. If the single most important factor for the success of a business is the capability and performance of the people within it, it follows that the whole process of selection must be one of the most important exercises in the business calendar. It is surprising, therefore, that in many companies, both the thought given to the process and the attention and time that is devoted to it is so rudimentary. Substantial amounts of time are often only spent on the selection of managers or future managers. But when it comes to recruiting for junior posts or shop floor positions, most British companies follow very simple, rather superficial recruitment procedures. The selection of people is an absolutely key task for senior management. Moreover, those to whom the responsibility is delegated should be carefully chosen and prepared for the task and may well require special training. No matter how systematized selection procedures are, it seems to me to be established that the ability to assess the ultimate potential of individuals after a relatively short exposure to them is a gift. Most companies and organizations have an individual who has, over a period of time, established a formidable track record for being able to spot latent talent. Where such a skill is seen in someone, 
it is well worthwhile making full use of his abilities. Selection of people is almost always better done as a group rather than by an individual. But the talent spotter can usefully be employed as a sort of roving member of all selection teams. As in so many other areas of business, this whole field of selection can be more easily carried out in small companies than in large. The owner of a small business will see, judge and select almost every person who is to join the company for every available position. Organisations benefit enormously from this consistency of approach and judgement. The larger the company becomes, the more desirable it is to try and emulate the type of techniques of selection, which are a natural feature of the small company. It must always be remembered that although selection is more often than not for a specific post or task, in reality you are choosing future members of the team, and indeed hoping to choose future leaders of the team. Most organisations will seek to develop their own future leadership from within their own ranks, and there are good reasons, quite apart from laziness and expense, why this should be so. Recruiting from outside is always a risk. You are backing your judgement on the basis of a series of interviews and tests, together with the written history which has been provided by the individual himself. References are unlikely to give the bad news, although a skilful reference reader will often detect any omissions, which are usually the only clear pointer to the weaknesses for which you are looking. There is therefore a great deal less risk in choosing an individual who you have seen operating in your own context for a long period of time, and whose characteristics, good and bad, you should be able to evaluate more clearly. It is not possible to quantify with great exactitude the costs involved in a mistake, but they are certainly considerably more than the directly measurable costs. For a start, there is the money involved in the selection procedure itself. The diversion of management time in training and all the extra management time which is inevitably going to be involved before you accept that there is no silk purse to be made from this particular sow's ear. There are the overhead costs associated with every individual, together with some sort of severance payment as well. But all these measurable costs, say between twice and three times the actual salary paid, are dwarfed by the loss of the profit expected to be generated by the individual, and the even more serious loss of profit and momentum from those with whom the individual is associated. It often takes quite a time for the decision to be taken that a mistake has been made in the selection process. There is an understandable vested interest in proving that the selection judgment was not so obviously at fault. Most failed selections survive for 18 months or so, and when the notice period is added on, all too often one is looking at an interval of up to two years. It doesn't take a financial wizard to see, therefore, that a mistake when choosing a man or woman on, say, £25,000 per annum starting salary can soon look like an unwanted extra cost of up to ten times that amount. It is obviously important to try to get selection right first time. and This can only be achieved by expending considerable care and effort and approaching the whole business of selection with a high degree of professionalism. Typically, there is an advertisement describing a specific job almost entirely in terms of the task that needs to be done. In addition to limiting the numbers of people who will reply by concentration on this one job alone, most business advertisements also proceed to further narrow down the potential selectees by giving a list of essential requirements. These will include essential experience, more often than not limits on age, and very frequently precise specific requirements for academic and or professional qualifications. Most of these are designed to restrict the number of people passing through the sieve and requiring to be seen, and most of them are, I suggest, more for the administrative convenience of the selectors than an open-minded attempt to ensure that the best possible individual is recruited. The omissions from this list are almost as striking as the closing down nature of the advertisement. There is seldom any list of the human qualities required in the job description, and although the responsibilities of the job and specific tasks are usually well described, the opportunities for change and improvement and the potential challenge afforded by working in the company is hardly ever outlined. 
Given the diffidence and lack of self-belief of many British people, it is not surprising that most people who read job adverts decide that they would not be suitable to do the job in question. When considering this whole area of selection, it is necessary to start with a company's policy on staffing. Most companies aim to recruit young people straight from school or university who are malleable and have not yet picked up bad habits elsewhere. Steady recruitment of school leavers or university graduates is in any event essential if one is to have a reasonable age spread within the company. After all, the primary objective of a business is survival and everybody hopes that they are setting up a business which will last for generations. This can only be achieved if there is a steady availability of people in the appropriate age brackets who can pass the relay baton on for the future. If the intention is to recruit at school leaving age, say, half the numbers of people, you will need to cover both your needs for future expansion and inevitable potential natural wastage. The most important thing to consider is what is a sustainable and steady rate of intake. If you are interested in attracting the best young people, and all this effort is really worthwhile if that is your aim, you will need to develop links and contacts with schools, universities, sixth form colleges and so on. By the nature of their organisation they are dealing with a continuous stream of young people. They will naturally tend to give preference to those employers they know they can rely upon to take, say, one or two graduates every academic year, rather than those who will want nobody at all for five years, and then suddenly call upon them for five or six. As well as some sort of consistency of idea about how many young people one should be seeking to recruit, and how often, provision must be made within the company for promoting people from the shop floor. People who have been given such opportunities as well as knowing their business backwards, have a commitment to and concern for the company which is priceless. However, it is an equally dangerous trap to decide that everybody within the company must be developed from within your own stock of shop floor and graduate recruits. There are real dangers in areas of high specialisation, such as information technology or accountancy, if nobody is ever recruited in from outside. Specialist organisations which are entirely self-staffed run real risks of becoming incestuous and believing that only they have found the Philosopher's Stone and know the right way of doing things. Overall, the aim of any good company must be to be a net exporter of people. Indeed, if the excellence of your selection and subsequent development of your people is right, this will be almost inevitable, because you will always be producing more people power than even the most ambitious, sustainable expansion can cope with inside your own organisation. The place to have studied, for example, production management, is Mars. Mars have, by the excellence of their managerial approach, continuously produced a stream of extremely able production management imbued with a fervour for continuous improvement long before the Japanese made these fashionable words. To have a reputation like this ensures that people who are thinking of following a career in, say, accountancy or production management will attempt to join your company. You therefore get a disproportionate chance of recruiting from those with the best potential. It is of the greatest importance when selecting people to be clear that you are never just trying to fill a single job. A moment's reflection will show you that it is quite useless to try to appoint a man or woman at the age of, say, 35 to fill a job with the conviction that there is no other job that they will be able to do. You will almost inevitably be forced to move them at some time in the future, or be lumbered with somebody who has lost their basic get-up-and-go and is increasingly time-serving in the job slot that you sought to fill. It is of the greatest importance that you should look for somebody who is not only well able to do the job that you have in mind, but who has the potential for onward movement, either within that specific field or in more general managerial areas of activity. One should be continuously looking for both characteristics. The ability to achieve excellence in the field of specialisation in which the individual is working, together with the ability to take a breadth of view encompassing not only the financial aspects of the business, but also technology, markets, customers and the external environment. 
Recruiting a new individual is a chance to shift the balance of the company as a whole. So it is important that you should bear in mind where you are trying to take the company. Business is a necessity to us all, and is a microcosm of the world in which it operates. It is desirable, therefore, to have within it people who can cover every aspect of that world, and who are interested in all facets of the world seen. Of course, perfect balance is never achievable, but every company needs a balance between the doers and the thinkers. There are many other pairs of balances which the ideal organization should have, tacticians and strategists, for example, or risk-takers and those blessed individuals who can continually foresee potential disasters to which others are blind. Outside recruitment is aimed at creating the team and characteristics you believe are essential to business success and what you will need in five or six years' time and thereafter. You are looking for the balancing characteristics that you need within the company as a whole. When all the preparations have finally been made, the moment comes when you have to actually interview and select people. It is important to be clear exactly what one is trying to do at the interviewing stage. The object of the entire exercise is to try to learn as much about the character, values and potential of the person as is possible in a very limited period of time and in extremely artificial circumstances. It is very important to remember that every candidate will inevitably be trying their hardest to make the best possible impression. The problem is compounded by the fact that few of them have any real idea what it is that you are looking for or what would be considered plus or minus points in your eyes. Most candidates think that the interviewer is looking purely for the technical ability to do the job, combined with the ability to agree with any views put forward by a superior. Very few of them realize that a robust defense of an idea in an interview is worth much more than submissive and often insincere agreement. The starting point of any interview is, of course, to explain that the whole exercise is a two-way stretch. While you are interviewing the individual, the individual is also endeavouring to make up his mind about the sort of people that he's going to work with in the future. The consequences of a wrong decision are equally dire for both of you. He will have wasted time, lost some degree of confidence, and will find it more difficult to start again with someone else. You will have invested time, effort and money in a lost cause. An interview which saves both of you from making such a mistake is just as successful as one which produces a future chief executive of the company. However, where an individual is judged to be unsuitable for your business, you at least owe it to him or her to give your views about the sort of company, business or job which might be more suitable for them. Candidates from a university really have no idea at all about what working within a company is like. They tend to have gained their views from older people or from academics who themselves have seldom lived a business life. When I left the Royal Navy and applied for a job with ICI, I had three motivating reasons. The first, which I think was a sound one and would have withstood any examination, was that I believed the country faced economic problems in the future and I therefore wanted to be in a basic business rather than a luxury one. I had already made up my mind that I wanted to make things, as that seemed to me to be the most useful type of service which I could render to my community. The other reasons would have been a great deal less convincing to an interviewer. Firstly, my brother-in-law, who had just joined the company, was full of enthusiasm about his experiences. In reality, this was entirely irrelevant from my point of view, because he was a highly qualified engineer and I had no qualifications of any sort. Nevertheless, his pride in the company was a major factor in my seeking a job with them. Lastly, the company had recruited two other naval officers, both of whom had been close friends of mine and had worked in the same department of the intelligence division. They were full of initial enthusiasm for what they were doing and had found the contrast with the Royal Navy a marked improvement. Had I not happened to have a brother-in-law and two friends who had just joined ICI, I might still have applied to the company. But it was my rather tenuous personal connection with ICI which impelled me, much more than the logic, even though I had thought the whole matter through most carefully. One certainly needs to probe the motives of someone for applying for a job within your particular business. 
but such probing will almost always be replied to in terms, which, although they may well be true, border on obsequious flattery that yours is plainly the best company in its own field. If that reply is given, it is always worth asking why. What makes the candidate make such a statement? And what does he believe is the basis of your competitive success? When interviewing candidates, it is absolutely essential to avoid leading questions. The worst questions of all are the sort to which there is plainly only one acceptable answer, usually yes or no. Do you drink a lot of alcohol? is unlikely to be answered with an enthusiastic, even if truthful, yes. Whilst the question, are you good at taking the initiative, is unlikely to be answered with a no, no matter how qualified. The candidate should be given plenty of opportunity to ask you questions about the company, or to ask your own views or advice on any particular subject. Remember, however, that whilst the candidate is entitled to elicit information, the object is for the interviewee to do the talking. If the candidate shows a certain amount of interest in one of one's pet subjects, it is very easy to fall into the trap of rabbiting enjoyably on about yourself, your views, your experiences, and so on while the clock ticks on. The worst feature of this is that at the end of the interview you end up feeling warm, happy and well disposed to the candidate, who has actually successfully interviewed you. It is also important to try to build some sort of emotional bridge with the candidate early on, no matter how slight and it is very important to avoid squashing a candidate's confidence once a bridge has been built with him at any stage of the interview. The ideal is to get to the stage when he or she is less conscious of the formality of the occasion and is sufficiently at ease to talk freely and openly about themselves, their interests, their motives and their ambitions. Even when candidates express views which are, in your opinion, totally stupid, a wise interviewer will merely comment on it being an interesting viewpoint rather than giving vent to the perhaps justified view that the candidate is talking nonsense. The good interviewer will have done his homework and will approach the interview with at least some preliminary ideas which he will have gleaned from the paperwork he has seen. The design of the application form itself should seek to draw out as much information as possible from the candidate the sort of things that will give you some starting clues about what to expect to see when you actually meet the individual are firstly the presentation and tidiness of the application form. Does it look as though the individual has not only thought his way through each answer, but written it down on a piece of scrap paper before entering it into the form? Has he used the space available to best effect? Or has he put in lots of unnecessary and extraneous words and adjectives and adverbs? Has he refused to be restrained by the actual size of the form when there is something he has wanted to say? Has he been quite happy to write a separate note, expatiating on some particular point that he wants to make? What are the sort of things that the candidate has believed will be important to you as a company? Does he show signs of having actually investigated the company? Is there any evidence that he has read up about it? The candidate who really wants the job will have put a great deal of thought into the completion of his application form and will stress the points that he believes will be relevant to the specific job and your particular business. However, it is as well to be aware of the weaknesses of the written application as well as its strengths, and this is why it is vital to meet a candidate as well as read about him. It is possible for a candidate to produce the most marvellous paper picture which bears little or no resemblance to reality, or it can all work the other way round. Time and again I find that the person who on paper seems the most ideally fitted for the job you are seeking to fill proves in person to have some major weakness or disadvantage, whilst the dark horse may well come from a much less appealing written application. Most of the entirely hopeless candidates will be weeded out when the first sift of the paperwork is done. The sensible interviewer will make sure that he has quickly checked through the discards, the ones who are not even going to the interview stage. It goes without saying that any applicant for a job must receive a, a reply from the company. The thing that infuriates people most of all, and does the company the most harm, is the absence of any sort of reply whatsoever. But this is only marginally worse than the obvious standard response. 
should not be beyond the wit of man to add a sentence or two to every standard letter, which at least shows that you have read the application, and that you are concerned about the individual, and that you wish them success in the future. Of course, the main clues that one is looking for in the application form are signs of real achievement and striving for growth. Your business needs doers and achievers. Nice ideas or good motives and aims are not in themselves enough. People must actually have created or achieved something. Moreover, a careful reading of any individual's curriculum vitae should show signs of continual growth. The jobs they move to and the things they have undertaken should all broaden their experience and increase their abilities. When reading the curriculum vitae of experienced, mature people, their reasons for moving from one company to another are particularly important. The irony is that the individual who is constantly frustrated by not having enough headroom and who moves on to better himself may look, purely from reading his CV, remarkably similar to the individual who has consistently failed to achieve anything and has been nudged out of one company after another. It is the reasons for moving which are the key. Nobody should ever be blamed for one move when they have found that the chemistry between themselves and their bosses did not work. Four or five such moves, however, are more likely to show that the candidate is in the awkward squad. Many companies go in for a whole battery of other aids to selection, including psychological assessment and even graphology. Both of these approaches are well demonstrated as having something to offer in terms of different insights into what makes people tick. I would have thought that my handwriting would have defeated any graphologist, and yet blind readings of samples of my score have been, in the view of my family, surprisingly accurate about some of my characteristics. Particular danger signals to watch for in interviewing are strong emotional reactions based on positive or negative chemistry. We all start with an instinctive view of an individual the moment we clap eyes on them. Indeed, the process of beating someone is a sort of selection process, during which we seek to categorize them according to our own prejudices. The fact that a man wears a ponytail, or a girl a nose ring, is equally irrelevant for your purposes as to whether they went to your old school, or played golf, or tennis at your club. If you find yourself feeling strongly for or against the candidate, that is the moment to redouble your efforts to check the realities behind the prejudice. Plainly, there are quite big differences between the selection procedure for new graduates and those for mature and experienced candidates. In the case of the mature applicant, they already have a fairly considerable track record of achievement, and there are people you can talk to about them. You are less likely to benefit by a two-day selection procedure than you are in the case of the graduate. In my view, it is worthwhile setting up a proper selection group for graduates, which would normally mean that the candidate has about three interviews. Interviews should be chosen from, say, line managers with backgrounds of relevant responsibility and a selection specialist, who may be from any background, but who has good analytical and selection skills, particularly with young people. As well as your interviewers having a mix of backgrounds, it is not a bad idea for them to have a mixed range of age and experience. In any event, it is important to ensure that all selectors are able to relate to younger people. Older people with families of their own are often extremely good in this area. I believe that a group of something like six to eight graduates is the ideal number that a selection board can manage to deal with sensibly. You should be aiming for something like a 30% success rate. So ideally, you should be looking to hire two or three of the candidates. But it is quality that you are essentially looking for. And if the quality is high, you should be prepared to be flexible. Top quality people are always in short supply. And one does not get that many opportunities to recruit. Really high quality organizations have a very clear mental picture of the sort of people they want and will recognize them very quickly. It can be even more dangerous to draft in inferior candidates purely because the initial selection has not turned up the quality of applicant for whom you are seeking. If this happens once, it may be the luck of the draw. If it happens consistently, you and your firm have a real problem. Either in fact, or at minimum in perception, you are not competitive, and the best young people don't want to know. There is no doubt that the best attract the best, and if you are consistent in your own standards, this is soon known. 
The undergraduate network will spread the news like lightning that a job with your firm is in itself an accolade. Experience at Marks and Spencer's, Shell or Ford has never harmed anybody's career prospects in other companies. I believe that the whole board should take an interest in the graduate recruitment procedure. The chief executive, or at minimum a board member, should meet the group of candidates at the beginning of the whole procedure and should then spend a few minutes with each of them at the end of it. Having assembled the team and done the shortlisting, I believe the ideal recruitment procedure should take an evening and a full day. The graduates should arrive the evening before and have an informal dinner with the selection group and the chief executive or board member. Even though the evening is informal, it will give you your first chance to see the candidates and how they interact with each other. Do they drink too much? Do they talk too much? Do they show off? Are they highly competitive with each other or are they calm and reflective? Such an informal evening can reveal a great deal about the incoming candidates. The following day each individual should be interviewed and then the whole group should be watched tackling specific practical tasks in subgroups of three or four in a competitive environment. These sort of tasks will speedily show who are the natural leaders and will tell you a great deal about the way in which the individuals interact. At any time when they are not involved in interviews or practical tests, the candidates should be given the maximum opportunity to see the business and to meet individuals of approximately their own age who are working within it so they can find out as much as possible about the company and have the maximum opportunity to ask informed questions. Your best recruiting agents with graduates are young people who have recently joined you and who can say from first-hand experience what they like or even dislike about the company. They can talk about the jobs they have been given and whether the company has lived up to their expectations. Young people feel much more comfortable with their peers and are also more likely to trust what they hear from them. Many of the points above apply equally strongly to interviewing the mature applicant, but there are important differences. Perhaps the most obvious one is that they have a history of performance in the world of work, which should tell you a great deal about how useful they are likely to be in your own setup. The sort of jobs they have filled, the things they are proud to have achieved and their reasons for moving on can all tell you a great deal about the person. Moreover, you will probably know someone with whom he or she has worked and a quick telephone call will fill in quite a bit of detail. Remember, redundancy more often than not has nothing to do with the individual's performance and, if you can, it is worth asking questions about the criteria used for selection. Redundancy is very seldom the fault of your candidate. Its roots are far more likely to derive from failures at the top of the company than to have had anything to do with the hapless sufferers down the line. Even though the task of selection is easier, there is more at stake with a mature candidate than with the young graduate. They will be joining you in a position of responsibility and can create a fair amount of havoc before you part company if you have made a mistake. And the amounts of money at risk are also greater. The main aim of the interview with a mature candidate is therefore to find out about the type of person they are and their way of working rather than their ability to do the task in hand which can be checked relatively easily. Interviewing is a specific skill and like all managerial tasks must be learnt and should also be reviewed regularly. Selection teams should spend a little time talking about their own performance and striving continuously to become more effective. It can be a good idea to ask one member of the team to prepare a critique of the interviews which you have held so you can talk about them together afterwards. When school leavers join your firm, the pattern of their expectations about the organisation they have joined are formed within the first month or so. All the more important, therefore, to make sure that their first months in a new firm are not spent entirely in getting to know the ropes. Many a good future employee has got an altogether wrong view about the expectations of their employer to have been given a carefully planned itinerary in which days or weeks are spent in each of the functional departments learning what goes on. There's no sense of urgency and very little follow-up to see what has actually been learned. 
The opposite approach can be equally damaging. A nod in a general direction and the words, that's where you'll be working, there's plenty to do, get on with it, hardly constitutes a helpful induction program. Introducing an employee to a new job requires as much thought on the part of the manager as any other aspect of his relationships with his employees. The first and most important point to make is that the start of a recruit's career is the direct responsibility of the line manager. In a great many companies and organisations, it is left to the personnel department to make whatever arrangements are thought appropriate to get the individual there on time and to organise the introduction to the company. A priceless opportunity to reinforce the position and standing of the line manager is therefore lost. The impression is given that the well-being of the individual is the responsibility of an amorphous department rather than that of an individual. At this stage, most new recruits look upon their manager as a curiously remote creature. They imagine that their relationship will be something like that which they enjoyed at university with a head of department, rather than the direct and continuous contact which a working team ideally should enjoy with each other. Whilst wishing to be treated as a fully-fledged and experienced adult, they will nevertheless still be suffering from the same uncertainties which beset young people everywhere. A mentor can act as an excellent intermediary, and moreover the experience of inducting a new recruit can be an excellent one for a man or woman who is a year or so into operating experience. In addition to the obvious problems of accommodation, working hours, pay systems and conditions which have not been spelt out in the letter of appointment and so on, there are some critical instructions which they must be given before they start work of any sort. Safety would always come top of my personal list. I believe that safety in a factory or work situation is an attitude of mind. Companies have an absolute obligation continuously to remind their people of their individual obligations for their own safety and also their collective responsibility for the safety not only of other employees but also of the firm's customers and of its neighbours. I believe that presentations on responsibilities for safety should be carried out even before an introduction to the work of the company. It should be demonstrated as being of preeminent importance in the eyes of the employer and come before considerations of profit or anything else. After you have presented the safety policy of the company and given the necessary warnings to the new employees, you then have an ideal opportunity to present the aims and values of the company and the expectations which the firm has of its employees. Only when these preliminaries have been gone through is there any point in beginning to explain the job and make the various introductions which are appropriate. It is the task of the mentor to make sure that the recruit meets everybody with whom they may be in contact in the future and is given the opportunity of a few moments of discussion with each of them. Then on to the job. It is important that responsibilities should be passed as quickly as possible to people starting their career. The aim should be that the individual should feel that he or she is being stretched continuously for at least the first two or three years and hopefully thereafter as well. They should feel that they are always being asked to do more than they think they can actually achieve. It is important, however, that the tasks which they are being given should not be beyond their ability to accomplish. Individuals must always feel the weight of responsibility. They should feel that help and advice are at hand, but they must never feel that the job is being done for them. The balance between learning and doing is an important one. The man or woman will spend the rest of their career doing both of these, and in an ideal world, he or she should start that way. Nothing in the world of business is ever static. Processes, products, cash, Service to customers should all be changing for the better the whole time. The pressures for change in this modern world never stop. There is never a perfect business, merely one which is temporarily better than its competitors. There is a very big difference between this and the academic background from which your young recruit has just come. This change from a world of apparent absolutes to one of change and improvement is a very difficult one to bridge. The attitudes involved in striving for continuous improvement are not ones which have usually been inculcated during most people's schooling. Young people who join business think that they are being employed to supervise, oversee or take decisions. 
The idea that they are the prime instrument of change and that the pace, scale and goals of change are their main area of responsibility is not easily or quickly understood. The induction of a beginner involves continuously questioning what is being done and pointing out where things could have been done better while still maintaining their confidence so that the individual doesn't feel that nothing he does will ever be satisfactory. People learn fastest when there is a careful balance between praise for effort and expectations for higher achievement. Young people in particular need encouragement and their self-esteem and self-belief building up. The aim should be for the new recruit to hit the ground running. The luxury of idle time should not be given and from the first a pretty spanking pace should be set in order to get the new starter up to speed with the expectations of the company as a whole. If you have got the pacing right, there should not be too much time or energy left over to pursue much in the way of a hectic social life in the first few weeks. Nevertheless, it is important to remember that no one works for a company every moment of every day. New recruits should look back on their first months as having been very hard work, during which they were continuously concerned about their ability to carry the level of responsibility which has apparently been thrust upon them. In a well-organised setup, the reality of life will be that someone will be constantly keeping a careful eye on the workload and responsibilities. But it is important that this should not be realised. Nor should you intervene until the very last moment. Too much checking or too early intervention removes the feeling of responsibility and in turn delays the growth of the well-rounded, self-motivated manager, which is the object of the whole exercise. Amongst the mentor's other responsibilities should be to find out what the recruit's interests and hobbies are, and to make sure that he is aware of the local opportunities for following them, be they sailing, folk dancing or pub crawling. The manager responsible for the new starter should initially aim to spend a bit of time with them every week. It does not have to be a tremendously detailed review of the week's work, but 15 minutes or so of talking through what has happened, what has been achieved, what are the difficulties will not only cement the relationship but also give a strong enough view of the progress which is being made to enable the manager to tighten or loosen the pressure as appropriate. It might be a good idea for the manager to invite the new recruit to his home or to a meal in a pub or a restaurant after about six weeks in the job. And it can be helpful for people further up the line to have the opportunity to meet him socially after he has been with the company for a few months. As a head of division or chairman of a large company, I was always anxious to meet the young people who had joined within the last few months. Such meetings gave me the opportunity to reinforce the value system of the company, as well as enabling me to check on the calibre and quality of new recruits. I also very often came away with a totally fresh and very valuable viewpoint on how the company looked from the bottom up. There are many different views about the roles of social life within a company or organisation. I have never been one of those people who think that companies gain by ensuring that every moment of every day is spent in a company environment. Your employees will decide for themselves what are the levels of interaction they wish to enjoy outside normal business activities. Inevitably you will find some of them heading towards the same sorts of clubs, bars or activities, and in itself this is not a bad thing. But these are things which are best generated by your people themselves. Many companies believe in elaborate job descriptions which define the scope, responsibilities, powers and even in many cases the methods of doing the job. Personally, I do not think this is the best way to grow people. Not only does it restrict individual initiative, but it also produces a lack of flexibility in the whole organisation which can be fatal. There are very few tasks in business which can be carried out by one person on their own. The job description should make it clear where the primary responsibility for achievement lies. It also should make clear that the goal must be reached with the help and collaboration of other departments, suppliers, customers, or if necessary, outside organisations. The newcomer should be encouraged to think as broadly and to consult as widely as possible. One of the things that he or she has probably brought with them from their experience of further education is the understanding of where to seek knowledge although they may have less understanding of how to apply it. The point must be continuously reinforced that the individual will be judged by achievements rather than by the manner in which that achievement was reached. 
At the same time, it must be made clear that business relies on ongoing relationships. It is important that it is made plain that in the process of achieving the goal which has been set by the company, people must be involved and supportive rather than antagonized, because their help, advice or support will inevitably be needed on future occasions. These are lessons which can only be learnt in practice and through continual gentle coaching. Young people tend to believe that the road ahead lies in satisfying their boss or achieving good marks in a particular test. They do not so readily understand that in reality they are being tested by everyone with whom they are now in contact, be they subordinates, peers or others in a commercial relationship with them. Both the manager and the mentor should initially set fairly limited and specific tasks and continuously point out why the task has been chosen and how it relates to the overall responsibility for the job. You have to make a choice about the first task you give your new recruit. This can either be within the minimum field of activity, making clear what the relevance to the whole is and stating clearly which other functions, managers and departments will probably have to be asked for help. Or you can set a broader scale problem and focus in from that to the specific actions that should be undertaken in the first case. The time to learn these key lessons are from the very start of one's business career. The very first instruction which I was given in business was that my job was continuously to find better and cheaper ways of producing more from less. I was then given a series of relatively small self-standing jobs where I was expected to apply this approach. Although it is important to keep the newcomer focused on carrying out the task in hand, it can also be helpful to encourage study of some other aspect of activity which is perceived as being necessary to the overall achievement of the business goal. Obviously it is better if the impetus for doing this comes from the novice himself. Beginners should not be persistently saved from making mistakes. You plainly cannot afford major errors which are going to cost the company or its customers large sums of money. But it has to be borne in mind that people very frequently learn more from their mistakes than they do from their successes. Better by far to help the newcomers to dig themselves out of the pits into which they have jumped with such good intentions than to just yank them out and tell them to start again. Plainly, initially, you will have to be prepared to spend a good deal of time coaching and overseeing the beginner. But it is important that they should still feel that they are steering their own boat. If they feel that every step taken is being monitored, the conclusion will be drawn that in reality no responsibility is carried. The good manager will ensure that his guiding hand is as unobtrusive as possible and rely on his scheduled weekly chats to produce the guidance required. The most fatal mistake with young people is to take the problem away from them. Very frequently you will find that they get completely lost and come to you saying bluntly that they do not know what to do next or where to go from where they are. This is a time for patient listening and careful questioning and on no account must you tell them what to do. In order to allow them to work out their own solution, it is worth gently nudging them to come up with a number of possible solutions. If the route they are taking is plainly one which will lead them into trouble, ask the relevant questions again. Because the inductee is inexperienced, he or she will very often not have even thought of these possible repercussions. The task is continuously to broaden horizons and perspectives whilst the man or woman is first learning about your business. The most dangerous situation is one in which newcomers not only become lost but actually give up, where they have become so overwhelmed by the problems that they become almost incapable of further constructive action. If you see signs of this, it is vital to move in quite quickly, but again without actually taking the problem away. Questions such as, how are you getting on? What are you doing now? Why do you think that will work? What are the other things you could do? Are all the staple fare of the manager? At the same time, the manager and the mentor will be sitting down and discussing the new recruit's progress and in many cases suggestions can come via the mentor more easily than from the manager himself. The process is helpful both to the mentor 
the inductee, and to the business as a whole. But again, the mentor must be cautioned against the removal of problems and responsibilities from the new recruit. From the very beginning, the newcomer must feel that the full weight of the responsibility for the achievement of the goal which have been set rests upon his or her actions alone. It will be helpful if the individual can gently be brought to understand that this will be the pattern of the rest of his working life. It is at this early stage that the whole pattern of the individual's career and his potential future in the company is set. It is not set by any carefully detailed plan. I have never met a manager who has actually taught the art of managing and growing an individual, largely because the skill of developing, coaching and growing latent talent is a highly personal one, because both the manager and the subordinate have all the usual differences and idiosyncrasies. What works with one person or at one time will not do so at another. Firstly, there is no permanence about the relationship. Either the manager or the subordinate may be moved to other duties at any time. Indeed, they may never meet again in a professional sense. And therefore, there is no underlying feeling that the repercussions of what you do today may have to be lived with in years to come. Secondly, there is the commitment to the whole enterprise. Although virtually nobody works purely for the sake of money, the days have long since gone when the mere possession of a job meant that one had metaphorically committed the whole of the rest of one's life to that firm or task. Mostly, we look on the job we have been given as a stepping stone towards the achievement of a wider career objective. The tasks that we are involved in today are in fact merely stepping stones to enable us to carry out other, more ambitious, fulfilling and satisfying jobs in the future. This is where the analogy with the orchestra really comes into play. Next week or next year we will be playing different, probably more difficult, music to a different audience. But the experience we have gained in this particular performance will increase our ability to play more confidently in the future. The art of managing individuals, and it is an art, does not come easily. Nor does it come without work, commitment and study. This attempt at continual improvement applies both to the generalities of managing large numbers of people and to the specifics of managing and relating to one specific individual. It is quite extraordinary that some managers believe that they can obtain the best from their people on the basis of seeing them perhaps for an hour once a year and keeping a rather casual eye on their output. Nothing could be further from the truth and those who manage in this way inevitably reap the rewards of their lack of care. The first essence of managing an individual is to be continuously mentally attuned to his thoughts and emotions, and to understand his own perceptions of his capabilities, which will vary enormously both from reality and from your personal beliefs about what he can do. The manager's greatest personal weapon is self-belief, and the conviction that he or she can actually achieve the objective that has been set. This should not be confused with arrogance. The good manager is acutely aware of his or her shortcomings and knows full well where or when they will need assistance, advice or the involvement of experts or others in order to accomplish the task ahead. Nevertheless, underlying everything must be a personal commitment to the achievement of the task and this commitment is not possible unless the manager not only believes that he can ensure that the task is accomplished, but actually thinks that he can do it better than others. Since the task of the manager is continuously to grow the aspiration and capability of his subordinate, he has a great responsibility for setting the pace of learning and for ensuring that the balance between success and failure is an optimal one. Setting individuals to do tasks which are easily within their competence results in overconfidence, and can lead to a lackadaisical approach to work and the belief that failure is impossible. If the task is made too difficult, the individual is likely to become discouraged and begin to doubt his or her own abilities. Making these sorts of judgments is very much a matter of individual discretion. There is a very narrow line between success and failure. However, most managers are on the side of too little challenge rather than asking too much. It is important to make it very difficult for someone to pass their responsibility up the line to their superior. 
The difficulty is that many managers love to demonstrate their own abilities by removing responsibilities from their subordinate. What better opportunity to lead by example than to tell your subordinate exactly what he or she should do? Such actions are almost always fatal. By the simple action of taking the task away, the commitment and ownership of the assignment has passed silently but inexorably back to you as the boss. You have taken the responsibility away, and it is the execution of that responsibility which is the process by which the individual grows. Business is a race. It is a race to change and improve faster than your competitors. Above all, it is a race of the mind. Not just a race between knowledge, but a race between the capability, determination, originality and sensitivity of your people against their competitors. The race will only be won by firms which embrace and evolve the full range of the latent human abilities of all the people in the company. It is the carrying out of this task, which is actually the key to future survival and success, that your people are expected to carry out almost as a byproduct of the responsibilities they hold. One of the tools most managers use at some period of their career is to carry a notebook with them so that they can note on a chronological basis ideas, actions and facts from the plethora of meetings and interactions they have each day. It is well worth noting how often you have actually spoken to your subordinate about the task that he has in hand and maybe jot down one or two factual numbers about the progress that is being achieved. Checking on the individual really must be done unobtrusively if you are to avoid the pitfall of removing the ownership and responsibility for the task. A lot of play has been made in recent years of the technique of management by walking about. I feel that this is not so much a technique as the normal way in which most managers should manage. During most of my business life I have tried to make it a practice to see at some time during the day everybody for whom I was responsible. Seeing does not involve necessarily even exchanging any particular conversation apart from the necessities of saying good morning or how are you or something of that sort. What it does mean is having actually visited the individual at his place of work and got some sort of feel as to what was going on. An experienced manager walking about can detect almost immediately if trouble is looming, if somebody is not actually pulling on the oars or has suddenly lost control of his boat and is being carried along by the rapids. The role of encouragement is of the greatest possible importance. If one were to measure this on a scale of sticks and carrots, there should be about ten carrots to every stick, and the carrots should be large and obvious ones, and the stick should be small and fairly minor. If you have got the scale of the task that you have set your subordinate right, so that he or she already feels severely challenged by what you have asked them to do, then your job is to reinforce their belief that they can do it by the projection of your own confidence. The essence of growing people is this combination of demand for performance encouragement in doing the task, and space or headroom to perform. This is where the constant communication between the manager and the subordinate is so important. You still need some sort of weekly progress chat and maybe to note down every week where you think the task has got to. But the difficulty with a formal weekly progress meeting is that it can become a sort of ritual. I believe that continual progress chasing coupled with the discipline of making a weekly note of one's own about how things are progressing is probably the best way of combining headroom with sensible supervision. A point which good coaches are continuously examining themselves for is consistency of approach. Even though you may not feel that you are the world's greatest authority on the task that you have set your subordinate, from his point of view you represent his only access to experience and knowledge as well as being ultimately the judge and jury of his performance. If he is to learn, or more accurately if he is to teach himself how to do the task, he needs to feel that the manager is consistent in his approach. As well as enabling your new team member actually to discharge his responsibilities, you are endeavouring to develop in him a philosophy of management and an approach which will enable him, over a period of time, to continue to develop without constant coaching. One of the primary jobs of the managerial coach is to overcome some of the rigidities of our education system. 
Young people starting their lives in business expect that for each problem posed there will be a textbook solution and tend to believe that their task is to find that solution in order to get an alpha as a pass mark. The concept that there are problems for which there may be no absolute solution or that in any event a quick and adequate solution may be better than the perfect one even if such a thing existed are difficult for them to comprehend. One of the slogans I have always believed to be most appropriate in business is that the best is the enemy of the good. There are a number of reasons why I feel that this is true. Firstly, the pursuit of the perfectionist solution invariably takes too long. Time and timeliness are the essence of business. By the time you've worked out a perfect solution, it has all too often been overtaken by events and is seldom relevant. Secondly, the perfection you are seeking exists in your mind rather than necessarily meeting your customers' needs. Your best solution may well not be appreciated at all, and it certainly won't be if it is too late. Overlying all of this is the additional factor of people. Everything that is achieved in business is achieved with or through people, be they customers, suppliers, subordinates or superiors. It is the managing of this cat's cradle of relationships while still maintaining a speed of progress that is the task of the manager. A major part of the coach's job is to draw the attention of the subordinate continuously to the impact of his task on the views and feelings of the people who he in turn is trying to lead, or the customers, suppliers or other departments which are involved in the accomplishment of his objective. It is difficult for young people who have been accustomed to an apparently clear hierarchical setup to understand that it is their responsibility to manage this complex array of relationships. It is very difficult for beginners to understand that it is totally impossible to apply such sweeping principles to one's customers and suppliers. In reality, although the responsibility and objective that has been given to your subordinates should be clear to everybody involved, the task will only be accomplished by the freely given collaboration of a large number of people, all with different skills and from different departments and so on. Ultimately, every individual in an organisation, even a closely controlled one, has two key areas of freedom, his attitudes and his use of his work time. These cannot be prescribed by authority and people will only give their support to a project if they're convinced that it is truly worthwhile. It is the job of the junior manager to persuade those involved to give their willing collaboration and assistance. Such interactions are only achievable by each individual being prepared to compromise in the achievement of their personal objectives in order to make the end result better. The job of the young manager is to understand this and to be equally willing to give up a part of his own ambition in order to help others. It is important that when coaching the new young manager, his or her responsibility for coaching in turn should be made apparent to them. This may seem a difficult concept for a young person who has little experience in their own field to take on board, since invariably people confuse the task of coaching with that of teaching. Coaching involves the development of the whole person, and even the youngest and newest raw recruit can do something in these areas. In particular, the beginner can be taught that, while ultimate responsibility cannot be evaded and always lies with them, that responsibility can only be exercised by encouraging subordinates and showing trust in them. No manager can control every detail, and yet no good manager can pass the blame for failure down the line. Do not fall into the trap which you yourself are trying to avoid, of judging beginners purely on their level of achievement. The way in which they do things is equally as important, and there is a major opportunity to teach young people the importance of analysing this, combined with interpersonal relationships at the very beginning of their careers. The good manager thinks continuously about how they do things, and while this is an abstract concept, the actual management of how things are done is a very concrete one. Amongst the sort of lead questions that should continuously be put to young people are What is the next step? How are you going to manage the meeting that you are holding next week? What are the objectives of the discussion that you are holding on Tuesday? 
All of these force attention to the process of carrying out the work, as well as the ultimate achievement. Much can be taught by questioning how much of the objectives of the meeting with so-and-so were actually achieved, and if they weren't, the reasons why they failed. What went wrong at the meeting? At what stage was it apparent that you couldn't achieve this objective? Why do you think X acted in the way that he did? And so on. As well as showing a proper degree of interest and concern in the work and concerns of your subordinate, questions of this type lead inexorably towards teaching the approach to work that you are seeking to instill. Attention to the development of process skills at this stage will pay off handsomely, as your subordinate becomes more and more able to undertake difficult tasks and achievements through the freely given support of other people. There are a number of specific gimmicks to managing process which can be taught. And it may be that in this, as in other areas, there will be areas of experience or knowledge which need filling in by more formal training than can be given by coaching on the run. Besides continuously stretching the individual by asking him to perform rather more than he thinks he can, the tasks that are given should also seek to fill in the gaps in the individual's experience. When a manager first joins an organisation, it is most unlikely that he will have any real experience of the complexities of the operation. This is particularly true in large organisations, where matters tend to become highly specialised. The problems of supply or distribution, sales, research, development or information technology are dealt with by separate departments, which seem almost to have a life of their own. Despite this, however, every individual down the line has to learn to work with other departments and to involve and utilise them if they are to achieve the business objectives which they have been set. Today it is almost impossible to carry out any research project without the active involvement of information technology. The influence of accountancy and cost accounting should be felt in every area of the activity of the business. It is as necessary for the young manager to understand the mechanics of such activities as it is for him to understand the dynamics of their management. It is almost impossible to achieve a trade-off between the various departments in order to manage the best possible performance of the whole unless there is an understanding at every level of the pressures, ambitions and objectives of the entire company. There is a view which is gaining increasing currency that the development of the individual is his or her own personal responsibility. Of course it is true that each of us has to take charge of the development of our own destiny. Indeed, this is one of the big changes that has occurred over the last 15 years. Many people in the 70s believed that their development as a practitioner, whatever art they were following, was primarily the responsibility of the organisation to which they had committed themselves. However, there is no way in which any organisation can achieve the continuous rate of improvement and of change, which is the key to competitive success, unless the people within it are also continuously growing and changing. This task of coaching the individual will remain one of the major managerial responsibilities, almost irrespective of what other changes in organisational concepts may apply. There appears to be a deeply rooted antipathy to training in the UK, both on the part of the managers and of those to be trained. It is possible that this stems from long-established historical attitudes. We have always admired the effortless amateur who can beat the professional at his own game. We have always had a disparaging attitude to intellectuals and academics. Real men in our folklore are invariably men of action, and we admire physical courage far more than moral integrity. There is no doubt in my mind that training in Britain is a grossly undervalued source of competitive advantage. Not only are well-trained people an asset, but a poorly trained and unprofessional team cannot hope to take on the best and win. We still seem to think that a sort of dad's army approach will enable our people to take on the business equivalents of the SAS and the commandos. Training tends to be looked upon by managers as an expensive and optional extra, and there is little basic belief that training is cost effective. Indeed, when the National Training Awards were first launched, it was a real struggle to persuade those who entered that they would have to demonstrate the effect of their training throughout their organisation. It is quite rare for a British firm or business to spend more than 2% of its total payroll budget on training and development, 
whereas our competitors would think that something between 10% and 20% would be a more appropriate figure. We have a mythical belief in on-the-job training, but even there we do not structure or organise our training efforts with any care. We think, as we do in many cases with apprenticeships, that putting a young person with an experienced one will automatically transfer not only knowledge, but theory as well. We seem to fail to realise that all that happens is that the bad practices which have been accumulated over the years get handed on and on and on. In Britain it appears to cause deep concern when it is suggested that an individual should go on a training course. Almost their first reaction is to assume that they are being told that they are inadequately performing the task they have been given. Far from the offer of training being seen as an investment in the individual, it is often seen as an adverse comment on performance. But perhaps the biggest switch off to training is the lack of confidence we have in our own abilities to assimilate new skills. One of the unfortunate legacies of our educational system is that the vast majority of us leave our schooling more aware of what we cannot do than what we can. Far from creating a national reserve of winners who have the self-confidence to believe they can master any subject or task that they wish to, we seem to impress in the minds of our people a conviction of their limitations rather than a belief in their potential. This is not just an attitude which one sees on the shop floor. All too often managers who are offered training courses either refuse or go under extreme sufferance and with deep cynicism because they fear being exposed in front of their peers. They would rather attack the entire concept of training or, even more damagingly, the particular course which they are attending than risk exposure. The fear of failing an examination is something which has been engendered in most of our people from the earliest possible age. Examinations are seen as being competitive and as tests to demonstrate our personal inadequacy rather than for any other purpose. Competitive marking is probably one of the biggest single turn-offs in this whole concept. Under these circumstances there is a chronic temptation to opt out altogether. Since the role of the manager as coach is well established, and most managers who have learnt how to grow people take pleasure and satisfaction from their achievements, there is an understandable fear of involving others in the development process. There is also the perennial problem that people will be taught to expect attitudes and ways of doing things which, when they return to work, they will find are not followed anywhere in their place of work. They will therefore become disillusioned or dissatisfied with tasks with which they were previously quite happy. In reality, this dissatisfaction is an essential ingredient of change. But the danger arises if this dissatisfaction continues and no attempts by the individuals to apply their newfound skills meet with any interest or success. Not only have you wasted the money spent on the training, but you're actually worse off than when you started. As if the foregoing problems were not enough, there's also the perennial concern of managers that as soon as an employee is more fully qualified and trained, they will use their newly established enhanced market value to move elsewhere for better pay. Whilst this is an understandable concern, the remedy cannot lie in keeping people operating below their capability. If your organisation cannot provide the challenges and opportunities for your people, you will find that they will vote with their feet in any event. Good men and women, however, are very quick to realise the advantages of continuing with a business which has continually broadened their horizons and opportunities. In this respect, a reputation for growing your people is more likely to keep them than a misguided attempt to hold them down beneath their capabilities. My own preferred solution to this is that every person in an organisation, from the top to the bottom, should have an annual training profile drawn up. This is probably best carried out at the time of the annual counselling chat. After discussing the successes and possible failures for the year, it is a good idea then to turn the discussion as to what other skills would have been helpful. Plainly, the manager will have his own ideas as to what he thinks might be good things for the employee to learn or study. But in a surprising number of cases, the individual concerned will confess that he or she badly wishes to learn more about some quite different thing. A course which meets an individual's professed interests and requirements is already three-quarters of the way there. He arrives wanting to learn, 
with his attention fully engaged, and is not so inclined to look on the whole thing as a waste of time. Moreover, a training profile which leads to action enhances both the individual sense of self-worth and also the reputation of the whole organization for listening, caring, and taking action. Many training courses of a day or two days are more than adequate at least to begin the process of learning. Nor should the advantages of modern technology be forgotten. It is now possible to learn from computers and other systems such as the Open University which do not need the physical presence of a teacher. There are two real advantages to these methods of learning. Firstly, the instructor can be the best in their field and a real expert in the ways in which complicated ideas can be most easily assimilated by the student. Secondly, and perhaps even more importantly, the student can learn at a comfortable pace. A point can be covered repeatedly without embarrassment or holding up others, and the learner can move on to the next issue only when they are thoroughly convinced that they understand the preceding facts. Although I believe that training is best done on an individual basis, I have encountered some remarkable examples of companies where an overall training profile of what is required for an experienced member of the organization has been sold in what I would consider to be a very sophisticated manner. I recently visited a joint American-Japanese company operating in this country. The workforce were all good, solid northerners, but they seemed to me to combine the best working and operating habits of both their owners. It was, of course, a single-status factory, where everybody wore the same sort of working rig, but I noticed that on their jacket breast pocket, every individual wore a sort of pie chart with varying sectors of it filled in. The sectors of the pie chart represented training courses which were available for any employee to undertake. And the fully trained individual, be he a manager or a member of the shop floor, had filled in the entire circle. Not only was this a mark of distinction, but it also meant that the training profile of any individual in any section was on permanent display in the place of work. If it became necessary to provide cover for somebody who was absent, you could quickly check who had done the necessary basic training to take the job over. With a really go-ahead organization, training should not be limited purely to the activities in their own outfit. A visit or secondment by some of your operators to work on a customer's line, or alternatively to work on a supplier's line, produces almost unbelievable benefits in terms of improved relationships and understanding. The companies that will succeed in the future are those which understand the interdependence not only of all the people within their own organization, but of all the people in the supply chain, from the ultimate customer right the way back to the raw material suppliers. It is the ability to operate this chain as one, albeit in a flexible way, that will give the true advantages in speed of response, predictability of quality, immediacy of delivery, and so on. Many of these sources of competitive advantage are in fact attitudes of mind. But attitudes of mind do not appear as if by magic. They have to be instilled, repeated, shown by example and trained for constantly and consistently. We need much broader concepts of the whole training process and the contribution that it can make to our ability to win the competitive battle. Managers need training in training. They need training in developing their people and they need to understand a great deal more about the processes by which people learn and how they become committed and involved in the whole process of learning. Just as with everything else in business, it is important to get more out of training than achievement of the single objective of improving one area of the skills of the trainee. Properly thought out and managed training involves a great deal more. Firstly, it can be a major influence on the building of the team. Training is something which can be done at every level of an organization simultaneously. The need to learn to present one's ideas in public applies to every department, every skill and every level of a company. It is possible, therefore, to have a public speaking course of, say, six people, which could involve shop stewards, a foreman, an accountant, a research scientist, and so on. Just the experience of learning something together creates a mutuality of understanding of the individuals and their contributions which far exceeds anything which can be gained from the normal interaction of work. Part of the problems of creating teams arises from the compartmentalization of the ways in which most people operate. 
They have a network of people with whom they cooperate continuously and whom they think they know well. But in turn, each is dependent upon the activities of large numbers of other people who are almost automatically assumed to be less capable than those within your own network. Nothing breaks down barriers more than the realization that all of us have the ability to learn a new skill at roughly the same sort of speed and that each of us has something to contribute to the whole. The role of training and team building is not merely confined to enabling individuals in different sections of work to meet each other on neutral ground. Properly thought out training courses and systems give a common language and help to impart a sense of common values as well as the mutuality of respect which is the basis of the creation of all teams. These aims are only achieved by giving considerable thought to the whole training process. Perhaps the primary role of the manager or the training manager in a large organization is to be continuously scanning the horizon to find out what is available and to pick the training courses and the training methods and locations which will best suit the values and ambience of your company. I know numbers of companies who feel that their people have benefited by the wholesale use of the courses provided by the Leadership Trust. The selection of courses and training methods is a key decision and wants the same amount of thought and involvement by top managers that any other key decision in the business justifies. I greatly favour sandwich courses or MBA courses for mature students who have already had some practical experience. If you decide that the MBA route is a useful one for your company, it is as well to build a relationship with a training organisation or school who will take the trouble to understand your particular business needs. In extreme cases, many business schools will actually lay on specifically tailored courses for your own outfit. However, in many cases, I believe that some of the advantages of an external training organisation of this type are gained by your people having the opportunity to meet and interact with people from other organisations and other countries. In my own case, I made extensive use of INSEAD at Fontainebleau as a means of exposing British managers to their European counterparts. And I used the International Management Institute at Geneva for people who would have to operate in the less developed parts of the world and who needed a greater understanding, for example, of the conditions pertaining in South America or Africa or parts of Asia. The question of extended courses is a controversial one. In almost any organization, there are some people who will benefit from attending a business school. But if they are to do so, it may well be a good idea to try to meet more than one training objective at the same time. A school which has a breadth of international appeal or specific cultural and geographical experience may well fill in another gap in a trainee's background at the same time. However one looks at training, it is an expensive investment, both for the company and for the individual. And it therefore warrants at least as much care and attention as anyone would apply, for example, to the purchase of a new machine tool or a capital investment. For that is what training is. It represents investment in the capital of the knowledge and skills of your people. And it is on that that your company has to rely for competitive success. Every company has to have a large number of trade-offs between the effect on the individual, the needs of the group, and the requirements of the business. These trade-offs cannot be limitless, even though the mathematical combinations of individuals, organization, and reward appear almost infinite. Some sorts of principles have to prevail, even if, as I tend to favor, one is prepared to accept a considerable degree of chaos in an organization in the interests of speed and flexibility. There is a general hope that somewhere there is an all-seeing, all-powerful individual was actually directing the myriads of worker ants to create a beautiful harmony from their individual and apparently disparate efforts. This is often expressed in terms of, you just tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it, or why don't they make their minds up? Such yearning for order and clarity is understandable, but it contrasts with our wish for freedom and the ability to exercise our own choices and affect the totality of the group with which we are working. Let us look at the problems involved in getting the chemistry of the team right. Without question, the ability to work in teams and to adapt and swiftly change teams will be one of the keys to commercial success for the future. 
it is essential that the company ethos and value system encourages these abilities. To some degree, the problem of working as a team is a self-resolving one, because most people will not continue to work in a group with which they do not feel a degree of empathy. Prima donnas really do not fit into teams, and if they are necessary for the furthering of the business, their positioning in relationship to other people requires very considerable thought and care. Apart from the company values, which are the backdrop to the whole of personnel management in any business, a vital decision is made at the stage at which a new appointment is made to an existing group. When appointing new people, it is essential to recognise that while no appointment should be forever, an appointment which lasts less than three years should really be considered to have been a failure. Every time a new person is appointed to a team, the entire nature of that team suffers such a degree of change that it is important to have at least some idea of what this change may be and to try to ensure that it will be helpful to the business aims rather than harmful. Since the whole of business is about continuous change, no appointment should ever seem to be a straight replacement for the man who has gone before. It is an opportunity to create a new input and to make a shift in how the team works, as well as in a larger business sense. Appointments therefore call for a considerable amount of clarity about the way in which the group is working at the present time, as well as great business clarity about the changes which would be necessary for continued business success a few years ahead. Very few managers willingly seek to add somebody to their team who they recognise will be an irritant. Nevertheless, this is one of the ingredients which often does need to be introduced, albeit at an appropriate and tolerable level. We have all seen teams of people who have worked together, initially with success, who have become more and more comfortable with each other and the way in which they do things. The mere effect of replacing one individual is enough to destroy this cosiness. Additionally, things will only be changed as a result of the friction caused by the newcomer, and his irritating habit of questioning the long-established perceived wisdom. More often than not, the frictions that prove ultimately harmful to the progress of an organisation derive from faults in personal chemistry. So this was not in itself complex enough. A further consideration has to be the effect on the individual, both as a person, and on his business and career development. Like everything else in business, appointing and setting up a team is an art rather than a science. There will always be a wish, both from the point of view of the team and of the boss, to optimise the team in one particular direction. But it is the mixture which matters, rather than a theoretical optimisation of one particular facet. At some stage, before actually making the appointment, all the individuals concerned should stop and spend a bit of time thinking what it will do for the person who is appointed. Of course, we cannot ensure that every move that is made and every task an individual is required to perform will necessarily be to the immediate advantage of his or her personal development. Nevertheless, the corollary is equally untrue. Unless the job, the team and the chemistry all contain the opportunity for some personal growth, it is very unlikely that the individual concern will actually perform well in the job you are seeking to create. This question of the development of the individual could be helped enormously if you have some idea of the dynamics of team building. The onus lies at least as much on the team to adapt to him as it does to him to adapt to the rest of the team. The reality of a member joining a new team is that the whole team will have to adjust a bit and the new individual will have to adjust a lot. Unless this happens, you will fail to keep the dynamic of improvement in your own group and you will also fail to switch on the new joiner. Of course, teams are not necessarily related to each other in a direct hierarchical manner. I have talked here primarily of the new appointment to a job where there is a clear boss, but a great deal of work in a modern business environment is done between networks and peer groups of equals, choosing to collaborate together in order to be more effective. Here it is much more difficult to design the team in the way that is helpful when a new appointment is made. For better or worse, you have to use the guys who are already in position, who happen to have the relevant experience and the relevant personalities to further the task for which the network is being set up. The skills and perceptions required for working in this way are very similar to those of being appointed to an entirely new company, 
with the exception that in a network of peers there's very seldom any clear managerial responsibility. However, you will speedily discern an actual leader who has established him or herself as the prime mover by their own effectiveness and adaptability. There will, however, always be the odd solo flyer who simply cannot work in a team at all. It is absolutely hopeless trying to build teams with people with incompatible personal characteristics or deep personal enmities, or indeed to create a team out of solo flyers. If a man is really incapable of working with others, then he must consider very hard indeed whether it is sensible to employ him in any role. Unless you are sure that there are roles which can be fulfilled effectively by the solitary individual, you are better to encourage the individual to look elsewhere for something which is more suited to his temperament. In my experience, there are very few people who are total loners. And usually, if they are, it is because of their single-minded involvement with their own ideas and technology. It may well be perfectly possible to employ such an individual as a specialist who is available for consultation, but not expected to involve himself in a broadly collaborative way with others. However, these sorts of skills are more frequently brought in from consultants or specialists in their own field, rather than carrying such a man in-house. And the question as to whether you do this or not is one which requires very careful consideration. As I pointed out earlier, one of the problems with organisation is that it really has to be a function of the current business objectives. Formal organisational change requires an enormous degree of disruption and upheaval, which most individuals find extremely difficult to deal with. It is for this reason that this sort of change occurs so seldom. Nevertheless, the theoretical structure of a company and the way it actually works are barely recognisable as the same thing. It is all of these pressures which have forced companies to look more and more to non-organisations of various sorts. Above everything, organisations have to be flexible and to be able to accommodate vast changes of business objectives. Moreover, they must encourage ease of working between the various segments of the businesses, all of whom have to be able to collaborate successfully if the business is to succeed against its top competitors. The good modern organisation does not have job descriptions but job responsibilities. The most effective organisational structure which will enable the sort of speed and adaptability on which business success depends is one in which the ownership of the responsibility has been successfully transferred as far down the line as is conceivably possible. Experience in organisations which have done this shows that an increased level of responsibility creates a much greater sense of commitment to the success of the company than attempts to compartmentalise and then coordinate responsibilities. People right down the line have to become accustomed to thinking about the broader considerations of business when they are looking at the ways in which they execute their own responsibilities. The only people who can coordinate any activities are the people who actually carry the responsibility. As so often in life, the aspect of managing people which attracts the most attention, the most debate and the most theories, namely pay and rewards, is also the one which seldom achieves the ambitions that are held for it. Because payment systems so seldom satisfy, and even less frequently motivate, there is a great urge on the part of pay administrators to produce predictable fairness in the way in which pay is allocated and set. Countless bureaucratic methods have been used to seek this philosopher's stone, usually with extremely complex mathematical calculations which will enable the exact relative worth of every individual to be placed in a provable context. The contract has to be acceptable to the individual, and yet limit the perennial onward march of one of the most important elements of cost of the whole business, namely the wages and salaries bill. It is this urge for provable fairness which seems to me to add enormously to the overall difficulties. Even the most assiduous attempt to take into account absolutely everything that an individual has contributed over a whole year is extraordinarily difficult. The experiences of the last few weeks or months are uppermost in one's mind, and there is a natural tendency to apply a greater emphasis to those recent events than to an occasion early in the year when something particularly good was done. The task itself is extraordinarily difficult without the additional pressures upon the assessor. 
One of the characteristics of British people is a great dislike of causing affront to others. Hardly anybody in the United Kingdom likes to be the purveyor of the bad news. Bosses shoot them, and subordinates hate them. We're happier by far trying to soften the blow by obfuscating the clarity of our remarks. Most of us have a God-given switch-off mechanism which enables us to totally misunderstand criticism. We cling on to the kindly words which are meant to soften the blow with such grim determination that we miss the blow altogether. In my view, fair treatment of an individual means that they have every right to know, as closely as you can convey, what are the things he or she can do better, and what is the best course for the man or woman concerned to take in order to further their own interests. No business ever prospered by holding back the individuals who go to make up the business. Businesses can only prosper when every man and woman in the business is growing and developing and is therefore giving of their best. The basis of fair dealing with an individual is that the individual should know where he stands and the boss should understand the viewpoint of the individual, what his ambitions and hopes are, and how an identity of interest can be developed between him and the company. It is extraordinarily difficult to produce an ideal reward system. Moreover, pay systems tend to be the subject of fashions, partly because of the market pressures upon any pay system. At the present time, we are seeing a heavy emphasis on performance-related pay. This is partly in an attempt to make pay a variable cost, so that the wages and salaries bill only goes up in accordance with the ability of the business to pay, and partly through the belief that a substantially variable annual reward will prove a significant incentive for the individual. Despite the wholesale spread of performance-related reward systems, recent academic studies are once again casting doubt on the motivational effect of such systems. There is nevertheless little doubt that performance-related pay systems do have the effect of channeling particular interests and concerns to specific aspects of the overall job, those which are likely to be rewarded. They will do so, however, at the expense of other aspects, and it is extraordinarily difficult to produce a formula of such exactitude that the forces which are unleashed will correspond exactly to what is needed a year hence. Moreover, as work becomes increasingly dependent upon the collaborative efforts of teams, individual performance-related pay systems may actually make it more difficult to encourage effective teamwork. Equally well, a group performance-related pay system in which everybody receives the same percentage or bonus payment can barely be described as a motivator. Either of these two approaches lands one in trouble. Payment systems are influenced besides the problems of comparability and fashion, by a number of other factors. Over a great many years, one of my only arguments with unions has been their view that pay must be dealt with entirely on a group basis. Under this credo, every fitter is entitled to the same pay, regardless of whether he is good or bad at his job. Fortunately, times move on, and union views with them. To pay everybody the same is equally as unfair as to have an infinite and necessarily somewhat arbitrary gradation of skills with minute differences of pay which tend to irritate rather than encourage. Most managers' preferred pay system would give everybody a generous reward and a few people a super generous one. Managers are just like every other human being. They want to be liked and admired by their people. They believe that people will work at their best if they believe they are constantly appreciated and rewarded. Unfortunately, while in an ideal world everybody would respond only to kindness and appreciation, very few can live on a diet of sugar alone. I have no doubt that the ratio of sugar to salt, carrot to stick, or praise to criticism should be weighed heavily in favour of the positive side. Nevertheless, constant reward without any form of criticism, striving for better performance or better results, or a constructive approach to higher effectiveness produces a sloppy and detuned operation. 
Yet another factor which plays upon the whole question of reward systems is the concept of what we have we hold. Although on a very small number of occasions in my life I have reduced the pay of an individual, as a broad generalization it is almost impossible to reduce pay without a totally disproportionate reaction. People are, however, prepared to have their pay frozen and eroded by inflation over a period of time. Certainly, where I have made a mistake and over-promoted a man and subsequently had to reduce him to a lower level, I have always taken a view that his pay had to remain frozen, because it had been my mistake in the first place to grant the promotion. Pay is only one part of the whole reward structure. It is important to look at rewards in the round. Rewards really encompass everything in business life. The organization, hierarchical system, the opportunities for promotion, the opportunities for recognition, forms of recognition which may include titles, delegated authority, freedoms of action and control, and so on. Of course they encompass pay, but they also have in the past encompassed a ludicrously infinite range of privileges. A different dining room, a different lavatory, a reserved car parking space, and so on. The reward system also encompasses that indefinable, but all too rare regulator of most of our lives, job satisfaction, which is a combination of the circumstances under which we work, the people we work for, and our perception of the significance of whatever it is that we are doing. The reward system also encompasses the values of the company and the systems of punishment. Although most companies go to infinite trouble to produce the most complicated possible reward systems, with numerous gradations of pay, privilege, status, and so on, remarkably few go to any trouble at all to consider or outline the forms of punishment that may be exerted. Yet, as I pointed out earlier, the punishment side of the thing is equally as important as the reward. It is as important to express dissatisfaction as it is to express satisfaction. Reward systems tend to be set up for administrative convenience and to assist budgeting and control. It is these pressures which lead to the established ritual of an annual reward. Sadly, during practically all of my business life, an annual reward has been a necessity, since I have always worked in inflationary conditions, which have meant the continuous adjustment of pay levels has been necessary, even to keep people where they started. It is possible that the future may see a change in this whole arrangement, although I am one of those cynics who fails to believe that we are likely to find ourselves in a period of prolonged zero inflation under which no changes will be necessary. Even within a zero inflationary environment, reviews of salaries would still be required in order to acknowledge promotion and performance. Indeed, without progression in pay, sparked by productivity improvement, there is no way in which a country as a whole can get richer. Many companies are looking more strongly at profit sharing. My own experience of profit sharing in a company which was one of the first to go this route in the United Kingdom is that it speedily becomes absorbed into the pay package as a part of the total pay. When, under my chairmanship, it became necessary to cut profit sharing drastically for the very simple reason that there were no profits, the shock to our people was almost tangible. It could be argued that this demonstrated the effectiveness of the profit-sharing system, and certainly an immediate feedback into the pay packet does bring the severity of the company's problems clearly and unmistakably to the attention of every employee. However, practically every external financial pressure upon the company is not only to maintain the level of profits year in, year out, but to aim for a steady, predictable, an inevitable increase in profitability every year. This gives a pleasing feeling that, in addition to the rest of the rewards, the profit-sharing element itself will increase every year, and most systems produce a sort of linkage, so that the profit-sharing element increases even more as a result of the increase in basic salaries, which are also contingent upon business success. The difficulty is that the whole effect is of a multiplier, not only do wages and salaries increase proportionately faster, but the effect of a cutback tends to be limited to the reduction in profit-sharing rather than an actual reduction in salaries. 
None of these comments are meant to eradicate the belief that some form of involvement by all the members of the company in the company itself is a thoroughly good thing. However, my own strong preference is to have employee shareholders rather than a financial allocation of profits. I believe those companies which have been set up with widespread employee shareholders, such as the National Freight Corporation, have demonstrated that the link, if large enough, can affect the way of operation of the company very strongly, particularly one which depends so self-evidently on the contribution of every man and woman for its ultimate competitiveness. It has been proven over and over again, in almost every field of activity, that what is perceived as unfair pay is a significant demotivator. Unfair pay, in fact, becomes almost an obsession, dominates every other aspect of work, and affects the whole relationship between the individual and the organisation. Unfair pay is almost invariably related to relative rates of pay within one's own company, rather than the relationship between one's own business and the competition. People will still work perfectly well and happily in companies which are known as poor payers, provided there is belief and trust in the relative fairness of the reward system that pertains within the company. Employees know that dissatisfaction in that respect can always be met by choosing to move of one's own accord. It is of the greatest importance that managers should continuously be aware of the way in which the reward and payment system is viewed. This is not to say that it is the duty and responsibility of the business to pay exactly what its employees want, or even in exactly the way which they would prefer. Nevertheless, acceptance of the principles under which pay is allocated and support for it is the critical factor in establishing the Hertzberg definition of fairness. Just as it has always seemed to me foolish to apply an arbitrary shift system or hours of work without consulting one's people, so it seems to me that the involvement of one's people in the systems and the thinking behind one's payment systems is sensible, provided that the right to say no is clearly understood. It is better to have the debate in the open than to have a continual rumble of discontent going on in the background. Ultimately, the way in which a business or company rewards its employees has to be in tune with the values that the company espouses. A major gap between the professed values of the outfit and the way in which individuals are rewarded causes endless friction for very little net gain. There is always a suspicion on the part of employees that pay is a purely arbitrary system to enable the managers to indulge their particular favourites, and that their particular favourites are rewarded at least as much for their acceptability to the manager as they are for the attainment of the business goals. Pay administration has to be punctilious, and within the system promulgated, this is yet another reason to avoid the overriding complexity of most systems. There are two particular aspects of rewarding which I believe are helpful, although they are all too seldom observed. The first is the importance of non-systematic immediate reward. This can take an infinite variety of forms, but the essence of non-systematic rewards is that they should happen as contemporaneously as possible with the action which merits the reward. The works management team who have just started up a plant and have been working 16 to 20 hours per day without stop or breaks for weekends or for three or four months, react overwhelmingly to an unscheduled week's leave to be taken immediately. The immediate reward of a sum of money, from 200 to 1,000 pounds, accompanied by a meeting and an expression of thanks from the manager for a job which had been outside the normal run of duty and has contributed visibly to the success of the business goals, has a much greater effect and is much less expensive than a salary increase at the end of the year, which will remain on the books forever. Moreover, because the reward has not been budgeted for inside the family, it becomes a genuine reward. I believe that every manager should have a small float to enable him to produce such forms of recognition in whatever seems the most appropriate way. The art of the unscheduled reward lies in the personalization of the reward and the manner of its giving as much as the value. I cannot be the only person who frequently attended retirement parties 
was shocked at the apparent lack of consideration given to the presentation. A tiny silver bowl or a single candlestick seem a meagre reward for long years of devoted service. The second area that I believe to be helpful, although again administratively difficult, is the question of annual rewards. I believe there is a real advantage in giving the annual review of salary on a man or woman's birthday rather than in one mighty bound at Christmas. While I realise that this worries people because of the aspects of control, I believe there are good reasons for doing it in this way. Of course it is illusory to think that it is any easier to be nasty to somebody on their birthday than it is to be nasty to large numbers of people at Christmas. The fact is, however, that a birthday award is personalised and gives you time to spend with the individual. Whereas if you are dealing with all your staff at Christmas, it tends to be a matter of forming a queue outside the headmaster's study. The primary reason why I think there is such a reaction against annual birthday rewards is the difficulties which are then placed on budgeting for the year. But if we are indeed reaching a plateau of zero or very low inflation, this particular problem will be markedly less, because each year you will be working within a level of productivity improvement which you have to allocate across the piece. In addition to unschedule rewards and the timing of the annual review, I believe reward systems should put pressures on managers to award differentially. There are an infinite number of control systems which can achieve this result without an elaborate gradation system. A very simple ruling that for every person paid above the average there must be somebody paid below forces a form of distribution. An even better one is to allocate a sum of money for bonuses or whatever accompanied by an instruction that the minimum amount to be paid out of the kitty will represent an amount which forces distribution. All too many managers, when given a bonus kitty to be allocated, will issue it absolutely equally to every member of their staff to avoid subsequent complaint, using the argument that it would be invidious to select any outstanding individual. Managers have to be encouraged to use freedoms in the reward system. They do not take to this approach naturally, nor do they enjoy the responsibility of administering rough justice. Equally, it is important to look at the manager's performance in this area and discuss it with him when you have his appraisal and discuss his performance. The most important two features of any reward system should be simplicity of the fundamental principles singularity of the system and cohesiveness with the professed values and business behavioural characteristics of the company concerned. The reward system has to be supportive to the business objectives and operational aims of the business as a whole, and its relationship has to be clear and visible. Within those broad parameters, my own ideal system would allow for very great individual flexibility maybe even a payment system which I have seen being experimented with in a number of companies in the UK. A system where the individual can choose, within a wide range, the way in which the total amount of money which is to represent his remuneration can be delivered. Flexibility between current salary, pension, car allowance or car, more or less holiday, and so on. The next characteristic which my ideal system would encourage, in my view, will be that the basic system will be supplemented by multiple recognition capabilities. There should be a wide variety of different ways in which exceptional work or contribution could be rewarded and recognised. These systems should not all be linked to pure numbers, but they must all be linked to specific achievement. The next characteristic that I wish to see would be that the system should force responsibility on managers for facing their obligations of levelling with their people, praising and rewarding the good, criticising and holding back the bad. In turn, the manager's reward should be able to be affected by his willingness to undertake this most difficult of managerial tasks. Lastly, in my ideal, every individual should feel that his or her individual effort will be recognised, and that by their individual effort they can have some effect on the level of their financial rewards. Although there is a plethora of books, management theories and other studies of the systems of reward in business, the flip side, which is the subject of punishment and reproof, is barely touched upon at all. All management is a matter of balance. 
There should be a balance between encouragement and touches on the reins and between rewards and reproofs. In business, one often receives neither praise nor criticism. It is inevitable that most of us spend a lot of time introspectively considering how we are getting on, and the first essential, therefore, is to have some sort of yardstick of the performance which is expected, so that one is able to decide whether one is achieving what is required. It is helpful to have confidence that, if your performance is in some way substandard, you will be told early on while there is still time to rectify the situation. The most detested organisations are the ones where there is barely even a lift of the boss's eyebrows before, like a bolt out of the blue, one is told that one's performance has been substandard for a long time and that it has been decided to dispense with one's services. In addition to a necessity for comments on the overall standards of performance which are being achieved, there will always be a need for instant comments of a tactical kind. These sort of comments tend to be about the minutiae of how the job is being done and come under the heading of friendly tips rather than statements of dissatisfaction. There is a big difference between the process of coaching and the process of reproof. Essentially, a reproof is needed in two broad sets of circumstances. The first is when the individual has already been told not to do something, or alternatively to do something in a particular way, and has persistently refused to heed the advice or instruction without reason or referral. The second area is where the overall general performance of the individual is continuously falling below the expected standards. It may be possible for the individual to correct these failures, in which case it is vital to ensure that the individual is given clear guidance if you are to give him every chance to bring himself back on course. If, however, the failure cannot be in everyone's interest for a parting of the ways to occur. When people are performing below par, a dressing down session will often reveal all sorts of extraneous and unexpected items which may explain poor performance. In particular, one should always be extremely careful to ask probing questions when a good performer goes off the boil. If there is a major change in performance, it is almost always due to some extraneous circumstance, and it is up to the boss to find out what that may be. The other circumstance is, of course, one where a genuine mistake has been made by both parties. The individual may not be what you first thought they were. They may not fit in. Their individual position in the team may not have worked out, or their levels of skills or personal qualities may not be adequate. Reproof under these circumstances is a preparatory step towards the big farewell. It is of the greatest possible importance that the manager should understand exactly what is involved when criticising his subordinate. Firstly, the manager must be clear what he is trying to achieve by the criticism. And secondly, he needs to understand the course of events which has led to the event which has engendered the criticism. It is almost always worthwhile sitting down with the subordinate and starting by having a lengthy chat about what exactly happened and what they feel were the circumstances which led to the failure or mistake. At minimum, this will establish your credentials for fairness but it will also mean that any consequent discussion or criticism will be based on the same interpretation of the facts. Most employees have a very understandable wish to deflect any criticism on the basis that the manager did not understand what had actually happened. Better by far to spend time establishing at least some common ground and perception so that this particular escape route is blocked off. Although criticism should never be made in anger, and certainly never in public, it is always best applied as near as possible in terms of time to the mistake which has occurred. With a long delay, the individual tends to cocoon a mistake in a sort of protective carapace, which places a lot of the responsibility for whatever has gone wrong almost everywhere except on themselves. The trick is to take a little while out to reflect in your own mind about the mistakes which were made, and whether a critical discussion will help or not, and then to decide the objective for the discussion. Plainly, one of the main objectives will be to prevent the single mistake happening again. It is not to produce a gruelling apology from a chastened subordinate. 
If the mistakes are ones which the individual can correct themselves, it is better to merely limit your criticism to comments such as, that didn't go very well, did it? Or, oh dear, rather than have a full-blown court-martial and commission of inquiry. It may be, however, that the mistake is one of a series, or suggests some underlying trend which is worth nipping in the bud. The keys to criticism and punishment lie in consistency above everything, coupled with integrity, fairness, and as near as possible total transparency. It is difficult to generate trust when imparting these sort of comments, but there is no time in relationships between individuals where trust is subjected to greater trial and where the existence of trust is more essential for the achievement of the aim. In this search for consistency, the annual appraisal plays a particularly important role, and it is vital that one is both the appraiser and the appraised. A well-carried-out appraisal and interview should tell you as much about yourself and your abilities as a manager as it does about the appraised person. Although appraised and appraiser are inevitably more influenced by contemporaneous events, the discussion is meant to cover the entire year of work. When things are going well, this is relatively easy. But when things are going badly, it becomes a much more difficult operation. It is always as well to start by asking the individual how they see their performance during the past year. If performance is below the expected level, nine out of ten individuals are aware of this and are already worried, particularly if the balance between approval and criticism has swayed too far out of balance. It is usually only the super-confident employee who actually looks forward to appraisal, and on occasions he or she may need taking down a peg or two. If there do not appear to be any extraneous circumstances of a personal nature which are affecting the employee's performance, the next thing to do is to check that the failure is not your own. You may have set the hurdles too high, perhaps made inadequate allowance for lack of experience or you may not have given the necessary delegated authority to perform. It is very important to be as probing and honest about your own part in the failure as you are on theirs. The fact of the matter is that if somebody is failing in their job, they are usually as aware of this as you are. If they are already doing everything they can, and the fault is one of expectation, there is frequently a real feeling of relief when they are relieved of that particular responsibility. If you are going to take this course of action, it is of the greatest possible importance that they are given a real job and one which they can actually perform. Finding a parking place in which you carry a failed, over-promoted executive is destructive both to the company and to the individual, for they soon know that they are the recipient of kindness, and their self-belief takes yet another shock. Above everything, the responsibility of a manager is to preserve as much as possible of the self-esteem of the subordinate, and even more particularly if the subordinate is likely to have to leave the company at some stage. It is bad enough to lose your livelihood without simultaneously having lost your belief in your ability to earn a living. People are never neutral after being fired. Every man or woman who leaves your company will either speak for the company or against it. The problem is made worse by the fact that every one of us hates discharging an individual, particularly someone with whom you have tried to work for a fairly prolonged period of time. There is an inevitable tendency to seek justification for your actions by demonstrating both to the individual and to the outside world that you have acted fairly, and that the person themselves is useless and incapable of doing a proper job. Tempting though this may be, it must be strenuously resisted. After all, you are still retaining your job and your pay packet is still coming in. The individual is leaving for your convenience, because of your belief that you and the company will be better without them. Surely under these circumstances, generosity of spirit and concern should be the order of the day. One of the greatest traps when discharging an individual is the very human urge you have to justify your own actions and to try to force the individual to tell you how fair and decent you have been. No matter how inevitable redundancy may seem, no one ever believes that it will happen to them. 
No matter how carefully the interview is carried out, the individual almost always goes into a state of near shock and finds it very difficult to pay attention to your carefully chosen words and evasions. All the individual remembers is that you have fired them, and their minds are totally preoccupied with the horrors of facing their family and friends and their fear of the future. They probably feel that it is all very unfair and are certainly not thinking about your feelings. After all, you are still employed. Time is needed for them to adjust before any rational discussion can take place. Unfortunately, the shock of losing a job makes it difficult for people to think of further changes, and most want to find another position exactly like the one they have just lost. Their pride and their financial circumstances make it difficult for them to contemplate a lower status job with lower pay, even though that may be the one which offers the best prospects in the long term. Moreover, hopefully, they will not be facing this situation too many times in their lives, and it is important to try to focus on the future. As well as being an unwelcome shock, redundancy can also be an opportunity to start again and refocus. It can give a unique opportunity to rethink everything anew and to take into account the range of hobbies, interests, places to live and so on, which have merely been the stuff of dreams in the past. People need a lot of help if they are to turn the chance which they did not want into an opportunity which can enhance their lives. Many firms use outplacement counsellors and specialists to help in this process, and they can certainly bring something extra to the whole business, provided they are not used as a means of passing on your problem. If you have made someone redundant, it is your responsibility to try to ensure that they find another position and build a new life. This responsibility cannot be passed on to the personnel department, the outplacement consultant or the labour exchange. You have removed all the certainties from an individual's life, and your personal support and help is the least that you can provide in return. Surprisingly few people who are made redundant think of setting up their own business, perhaps because the act of redundancy itself removes some of their confidence. Very often you can help to set up former employees as suppliers or subcontractors to your business. And the possession of an ongoing contract, even for a year or so, is often enough to help launch people on their own. Above everything, the redundant employee needs personal help and to feel that they have not been abandoned. It can be very helpful to have someone in the background looking at the books, helping with introductions for new opportunities, assisting with retraining to follow a new career, meeting for lunch or dinner every few weeks. These small interventions can make all the difference between future success and failure. Nothing blunts the initial shock of being made redundant, but good managers will be surrounded by individuals who will tell them that being made redundant was the best thing that ever happened to them. There is no single area where the conductor of the orchestra has more responsibility than to ensure that the players who leave live on to play again. During my 38 years in industry, I have seen unbelievable changes in attitudes towards the management of people and the whole role and theory of motivation, leadership and teamwork. I joined ICI at the height of the period of enlightened paternalism. The best companies had a deep concern for their people but this concern was evinced in a total belief that the company and its leaders knew best what was the right thing for every man and woman who worked for them. The company sought to supply a total life for everybody, including providing football teams, sports clubs, recreation clubs, and almost every other sort of activity. Even as the grateful recipient of all this attention and largesse, I remember being concerned that I was far too dependent upon my employer and in some way lessened as an individual by so being. Indeed, when I was recruited into ICI, I was ensured that I had a job for life. There is not even the remotest possibility that anyone joining a company or a business in the 1990s would be given such a comforting message. And indeed, not too many people would even want to feel that they had committed themselves at such an early stage in such a wholehearted manner. These paternalistic attitudes, 
although comfortable in some ways, led to a reduction in the wish to steer one's own course, and equally easily and perhaps inexorably, led to an increase in the power of the Union, acting on behalf of groups of people rather than the individual. The allowances for the individual really showed themselves in the welfare aspects of the paternalistic approach. These attitudes to management were already changing fast by the beginning of the 80s, when the political attack on corporatism in the United Kingdom really took place. For a short time, the extremes of paternalism appeared to be replaced by a philosophy that almost amounted to every man and woman for themselves. There were massive and politically inspired reductions in the power and privileges of the unions, and to some extent the restraining influence that the unions had had on poor management was markedly reduced. I do not believe that we had ever actually lost the power to manage. It had just become more difficult and required more skill and determination. Those managers who claimed that they were prevented from running their businesses by union power had, in all too many cases, simply abrogated their own wish to control the destiny of their businesses. The doctrine that there was no such thing as society and that every man and woman's responsibility was to do the best they could for themselves, appeared to me to be just as antipathetic to the pursuit of effective business management as the extremes of paternalism and union power had been in their day. Economic factors have an ugly and inevitable way of forcing very uncomfortable realities upon us, and it is difficult to buck an economic trend indefinitely. This trend towards individuals taking sole responsibility for themselves was accompanied by a number of other predictable changes. People began a merry-go-round of business moves, since by so doing they believed that they could better themselves more quickly than by staying with a single employer. People increasingly tended to view the attractiveness of jobs in terms of pay and perquisites, rather than that elusive and somewhat derided fact of job satisfaction. Under the force of economic pressure, organisations had realised that it was no longer possible to attempt to produce a career from cradle to grave for their employees. Meanwhile, changes in technology and the force and speed of international competition led to a multiplicity of experiments and changes in organisations and different ways of working. There was widespread recognition that economic forces alone made it impossible to run organisations with long management hierarchies, and determined efforts were made to reduce costs to competitive levels in order to force more and more responsibility down the line, thereby reducing the numbers of supervisors and the cost of overheads. Of course, working in these ways involved totally different concepts of the relationship between the managed and the managers, and of shared responsibility, both for the task and for the individual's growth, welfare and development. Although these concepts followed inevitably from competitive pressures, the change in the balance vigil in the organisation in many cases delayed the recognition of the different management skills which would be required. In too many cases, managers paid less and less attention to the management of the individual, believing that if they managed the hard economic factors, it was up to the individuals themselves to adjust. And if they would not do so, it would be easy enough to find others who would. Sharing responsibility is only possible in practical terms when all parties accept that they are interdependent, and as interdependent beings, neither has complete power over the other. When the recession at the end of the 80s proved to be both deeper and longer than anybody had expected, the confidence of individuals that there would always be a job for those who were willing to work evaporated very quickly. At the same time, the only way that many managers could see out of their problems was by reducing costs and, inevitably and invariably, reducing the numbers of their employees. Day after day, the newspapers and the media were full of announcements of massive reductions in manning by organisations everywhere. In their newfound belief in a world where the individual had to look after themselves, against a background of continuously increasing opportunity, People had borrowed injudiciously and had invested in mortgages and housing in the belief that their own personal circumstances could only continue to improve. 
This in turn made security of employment even more desirable just when it was becoming more difficult to obtain. The whole of this period was accompanied by changes in the role and expectations of the personnel department and personnel management. In the days of paternalism, the personnel director had been a combination of welfare officer and a specialist in the arcane complexities of negotiating with unions. During the 80s, the role changed abruptly. Personnel departments and personnel managers were given an altogether harder edge. They were expected to become experts at demanding, closing down factories, relocating and retraining, redundancy and so on. As the decade wore on, redundancies, firings and changes of course were increasingly seen as being a natural part of business life, to which the individual should be fully accustomed and able to adjust. The world of work has become an increasingly lonely place. It may be that we were put on this earth to learn individual responsibility and how to look after ourselves, but these are extraordinarily difficult things to manage without any outside assistance. Everyone really needs a mentor or a coach. Even chairmen of large companies need input from their peers and subordinates, and ideally a close friend, if they are to continue to develop their own skills and abilities. Clarity about one's own limitations as well as the potential of one's abilities is the rarest of human gifts. Moreover, even if one had an absolutely accurate perception of one's own limitations, it is almost impossible to have similar clarity about the way that one is viewed by others, which is an essential ingredient in building relationships with groups of people or when you are attempting to build a team. And so we come to today facing a further decade of change and ever fiercer international competition from other peoples with different histories and expectations to our own. I believe strongly that both for individuals and for companies the future lies in recognition of the interdependence of the company or group and the individual and the development of skills and concepts which will enable that interdependence and relationship continuously to be enhanced and improved. Teams can only work together if they are based on trust. And trust can only be based on mutuality of respect, integrity and mutuality of regard. These are not attributes that one normally finds amongst the villains of this world. They do not always sit easily with personal ambition. Plainly, every business manager and leader is not, nor could we expect them to be, a saintly person. Nevertheless, unless management and leadership involves the sort of decent virtues and use of power, which all of us would expect, it is unlikely that groups of people will operate at their best. Business in the 90s is, even more than it was in the past, a sort of marathon relay. Being in front merely gives one the right to try harder. It means that you are setting the pace which every competitor knows he has to beat. Continuing success for you and your team involves maintaining a faster pace than those behind you can possibly hope to overtake. There is no way that this can be done by the enforced willpower of a single man. It is the team working together, feeling responsibility for each other, understanding clearly that each and every person has continuously to improve their own performance and that of those around them, which enables the race to be won we're going to see further big changes in the ways in which people are managed. I do not believe there is anybody today who thinks that the management of people is just a matter of welfare, nor that the management of people can be left as a sort of fascinating speciality job to the personnel department and the personnel director. The management of people is the task of the managers of the enterprise, whatever it may be. The management of a hospital, a school, a regiment or a ship, a manufacturing factory or an office. If we and our businesses are to succeed, it will only be because we have a greater understanding of the forces which are at work and are prepared to make a marked change and improvement in our standards of skill and attention to the care, leadership and development of all of our people. If our country is to survive and prosper, it can only do so by utilising to the full 
the latent abilities and talents of all of our people. It is the task of the managers in our country to enable that to happen. On their success must depend many of the hopes and ambitions we all share for a better tomorrow. It is the conductor of the orchestra who creates the magic of a group of free and individual talents working together in harmony to produce over and over again even better and more memorable music.